Good morning and welcome to the 14th meeting in 2018 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I ask everyone please to ensure that their mobile uh, phones are on silent. Apologies have been received from Jamie Green who hopes to join us uh, in the meeting as soon as he can. The first agenda item is a decision on taking business in private. The committee is asked to consider item five in private relating to the evidence heard to date on the salmon farming in Scotland. Are members agreed? Yes. We are agreed. That we're going to therefore move on to agenda item two, which is about rail services in Scotland. And I would invite members round, uh, of the committee to declare any relevant interests that they have. Uh, Deputy Convener. Yes, thank you, Convener. I am the Honorary Vice President of Friends of the Far North Line. John. Yeah, I co-convene the Cross-Party Group on Rail. Stuart. I'm the Honorary President of the Scottish Association of Public Transport, Honorary Vice President of Rail Future UK. Okay, John. Um, I'm a member of the Cross-Party Group on Rail and a member of the RMT Parliamentary Group. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this evidence session is part of a regular update from Scott Rail Alliance um, to allow this committee to monitor rail issues. And I'd like to welcome from Scott Rail Alliance, Alex Hines, Miller Managing Director, Angus Tom, the Chief Operating Officer, and David Dixon, the Infrastructure Director. Alex, would you like to make a short opening statement um, uh, before we go into questions? Of course. Well, um, thank you, convener, and good morning to the committee. Um, I'm pleased to be here once again to update you on progress with Scotland's Railway since our last evidence session, which was in November. As you know, our mission at Scotland's Railway is to deliver the best railway Scotland's ever had, and we're going to deliver that through the introduction of new trains, faster journeys, more seats, and more services for the whole of the country. And this year, we will deliver the largest ever capital investment, 900 million in a single year on Scotland's Railway. Delivering an investment programme on this scale whilst also delivering a safe, clean and reliable service every day to our customers at the same time is not without challenge. And thanks to the hard work of the 7,500 people who work across the Scott Rail Alliance, we remain in top spot amongst the large operators in the UK for both punctuality and service quality. However, as we know, it's not just the numbers that matter. The experience our customers receive needs to reflect the high standards demanded of us and those which we set ourselves. It was for this reason that I commissioned an independent review of train service performance last year. This review has made 20 recommendations, all of which have been accepted by us, and we are in the process of implementing them. One of the recommendations, and the first to be implemented in full, is to change our policy on skip stopping. Whilst an effective service recovery method, we recognise it was unpopular with customers. We have already delivered a dramatic reduction in the number of skip stops, 70% reduction in the last four weeks, with a corresponding reduction in customer complaints. The ability of customers to get a seat, primarily in the peak, but not exclusively, is another area of focus for us. Whilst we wait for Hitachi to finalise the testing of our brand new fleet, we have hired in a fleet of electric trains to help restore the capacity we lost earlier in the year and provide more comfortable journeys for our customers as we enter into the busy summer period. Driver training started this week and those trains will enter service in July. In the coming months, customers can look forward to the introduction of those brand new Hitachi trains, iconic high-speed trains recreating a genuine intercity rail network for Scotland, modernised trains with free power and free Wi-Fi, all of which will transform the quality and the capacity of Scotland's railway to help drive jobs and growth and quality of life across the country. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to introduce this session just by asking you a question, Alex, if I may. Scott Rail has missed uh, 22 out of the 34 target areas in the first months of two, three months of 2018. It's been reported that that's resulted in £1.6 million worth of fines, nearly £400,000 from the previous quarter. Would you care to comment on those figures, please? Yes, of course. So, as part of the franchise agreement, we've signed up to the service quality incentive regime. It's the toughest 
regime anywhere across the UK and it's because of that regime that we have the highest satisfaction of any of the large operators in the UK. But it's fair to say that our performance against the standards which are set out in this regime uh, could be better and we're working really hard to improve our performance in this area. So some of it relates to resourcing and we've got action plans in place to make sure we remedy some of those issues to improve our uh, performance against those quality standards. It's worthwhile saying that any funds generated by the regime are reinvested in further improving the quality of rail services we deliver. Okay, Mike, I'm sure you want to follow up on that. Thanks, Convener. Um, I mean, I raised this in the chamber yesterday, and, um, and thank you very much for giving us the uh, information that you have done. Um, it just strikes me that the information that you've given us is very positive, but it doesn't address the issues that the convener just raised about um, those 22 out of 34 areas. And I'm just wondering whether we're looking at the same statistics, because, you know, depending on which statistic that you pick out to look at, would it not be fairer and easier if we all looked at the whole thing in the round and then we get an accurate picture rather than people saying, well, these are all the problems and here's all the, the success. It just strikes me that if you... Const I mean, I know it's your job to, to be positive and uh, to give us the positive information, but I'm more interested in making sure that we get the accurate yeah. information. So, I mean, from my perspective, uh, the people who should judge how well Scotland's Railway is performing are its customers. And that's why the National Rail Passenger Survey is so important to us, and we get that data on a six-monthly basis. And that places us uh, in top spot amongst the large operators. We've just had a question around the Squire regime. So that's all the softer factors of our service. Is it clean? Is it working? Uh, are we delivering great service? Uh, and that was the recent uh, statistics we, we discussed. Um, the recent information we've put out uh, relates to train service punctuality, and that's measured by the public performance measure, which is, did the train run? Did it call at all its scheduled stops? And did it arrive within four minutes 59? So that's the PPM. And in the last period, we delivered a result of 92%, which was a good result. It was the highest since the September of last year. Um, but most notably, we have changed our policy on service recovery to essentially stop the use of skip stopping. Now, that actually makes the delivery of the punctuality target actually that bit harder because when the railway is disrupted, it takes us longer to get it back to plan than it used to. But actually, um, it's better for those customers impacted. And we've seen a massive reduction in the number of skip stops and a corresponding reduction in the uh, level of customer complaints that we've received. Skip stopping is a real issue, and I'm glad that's being addressed. But what I wouldn't want to see is suddenly going back to previous situation because it's because the issue of skip stopping has hit the political agenda, if I can put it that way, and you're addressing it, can we be assured that it's going to stay the way that, you're, that, that, that uh, you've organised it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Donovan Review, which I commissioned, made 20 recommendations. This was one of them. We've implemented it in full. Uh, all the other 19 are in flight. We're not going back. One more question. I'd like to bring somebody in on skip stopping, Mike, but if, if you, if, I'm happy for you to ask another question. I'll do then Peter on skip stopping and then come to Colin if he wants to ask a question. So, Mike, do you want to, do you want to just my, ask? My other question here. I mean, it's to do with the 1.6 million charges. I mean, some people call them fines, some people call them charges. A, is it accurate? And um, B, if these improvements have happened, I mean, is, why is it such a high level of charge 1.6 million well one of the reasons why the penalties are um, that large is because the regime is really tough Scottish government sets very very high standards for the Scottish rail network um, that is why we're the top of the spot on the UK for punctuality and service quality and it's fair to say that our performance against this regime um, could be better and it will be better uh, we've got really strong recovery plans and we're taking steps to get the um, size of those
penalties down. Um, I'm going to bring in Peter Chapman, and he's going to ask a question not on what I said he was asking, but, but, but what on I knew he was going to ask. So, Peter, sorry. Thank you, convener, and uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, you've already mentioned it, Alex, uh, the, the fine, the 1.6 million fine goes into the Squire Fund. Uh, I really want to examine a wee bit more how you intend to use that fund, because it's, it, it is very useful. I mean, in the recent past, the Squire Fund was used, for instance, to to give rebates on tickets, and we don't think that that's was probably possibly the, the, the correct way to use that fund, but I think that was possibly uh, a, a directive from ScotGov. But I, I notice we've got a long list of stuff that the Squire Fund looks at, and, and stations, CCTV and security seems to be one issue that's fallen behind where we'd like to be. Litter and contamination is another one that's it, it's, you know, below where we'd like to be. Train seats and train toilets also seem to be missing the target. So I, I my mean, question is really, how do you expect are you, are you planning to use this extra fund to make the passenger experience better than it is? Okay. So um, obviously we build up this fund, which we spend on improving the railway, and we agree how we're going to spend the money with Transport Scotland. So to give you some recent examples of uh, the initiatives we've funded uh, through that Squire Fund, so we've invested £300,000 in body cams, for example, for our people to help provide a safer and more secure environment for customers and staff. We're in the process of upgrading the uh, waiting rooms on the stations which serve uh, Edinburgh Glasgow as we prepare for the introduction of the new uh, trains. Uh, we're looking at making sure that all the stations on the far north line, for example, are fitted with real-time customer information. So those are the sorts of things that we uh, spend the money on. So clearly we are always listening and engaging on what our customers are saying to us and then we have a pot of money there that we can spend to, to make things better, over and above the investment we're already making in the franchise. So, you know, this year we're spending a billion on capital investment in Scotland's railway. In this short period, we're spending about two billion uh, enhancing on the railway, a billion and a half on infrastructure, half a billion on new trains. So all of this is in addition to the money we're spending anyway. Okay, thank you. Sorry, just so I understand it, having looked at the uh, rules and regulations regarding the Squire Fund, it's up to ScotRail to put their recommendations to Scottish Government for how it should be used. Could you give, maybe after this committee, uh, a, a list of re recommendations that you, or proposals you've made to the Government to you, what to use the Squire Fund on in the last three months? Yes, so of course. What, what, what recommendations sure you put to the Government? To do that, yeah. So the committee can see where it's coming. Colin. And good morning to the panel. Isn't the reality, though, that, that, that the performance figures that are shown by Squire actually show a fallen performance? I mean, the, the figures we just heard about show that you met 12 of the targets for quarter four in 2017-18. In that compares to 15 for the same quarter last year in 2016-17, and it compares to 19 in the same quarter for 2015-16. For so the reality is that performance has actually fallen, not improving. And, and, and Alec, in your opening comments, you said and the most important people effectively were the passengers. That's true, the, 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 the behind these figures are, are passengers that are paying increasingly higher fares for a service that's actually in decline. So do you think you owe those passengers an apology for that fallen performance? Well, Squire is not measured by customers. Squire is a KPI regime, a key performance indicator regime, which um, is measured by Transport Scotland Squire inspectors. So, the, the, so the, the reality is, it's the passengers that have got the trains that are not clean enough. The, the, the passengers are the ones that have the stations that are not we, up to the high standard based we, on the Squire performance. It's passengers we, that ultimately suffer. Which is why customer perception is so important. And what rail passengers in Scotland say is that according to the National Rail Passengers Survey, we have 85% satisfaction. It was up on the year before. We're in top spot of the large operators. Can we do better? Will we do better? Absolutely. Absolutely. So you, you don't think these, these square figures, obviously, are, are important then? One of the, the most important parts of, of, the, of the report is that the, the figures in relation to, to, to CCTV cameras in particular, and the latest quarter figures showed... Um, 
a, a, a performance of 77.8 compared to a target of 95. Now, that's the worst performance since Abelio took over the franchise. It's 10% lower than the figure for this time last year. And we've seen a, a, a fall in performance when it comes to CCTV and security in stations in the last three quarters. Do you think that in any way is linked to staffing levels within CCTV and stations? I don't know. Um, the changes which we're making to our customer information and security centres are all designed to improve customer information. Um, that's that you know we're, we're passenger information during delay is a big area of focus for us. We want to improve the speed, the accuracy, and the timeliness. So those two things aren't related to one another. Well, this, the question was specifically around your performance in relation to CCTV. Um, and security in stations. Yeah. The, the figure in Squire shows that, that it was 77.8% compared to a target of 95. That's the worst figure since the franchise was, was given to Belio. It's 10% lower than this time last year, and we've seen a fall in the Squire figures for CCTV in stations um, and security in the last three quarters. So that in no way is related to the cuts in staffing within CCTV, you don't think? Correct. But it's not to say that we need to improve our performance in this area. Um, I, I'm sorry, I've got people queuing up. I, I, I think I'm going to have to bring Stuart in and then I'd like to go to Richard and then we'll move on to the next question. It's just a quickie on uh, train refreshment. As I spend 12 hours a week on ScotRail, I take a particular interest in this subject. Um, and uh, I, I see that it's at 91.5 with a target at 95. I just wanted to specifically ask if there are any uh, steps uh, being taken to improve that, and in particular, uh, w whether the introduction of the HSTs will change the food offering? Um, if you may. Yeah, please. of course. So um, the food and drink offer on board is a really important part of both the customer experience and the contract. Uh, and we're working to make sure that we're a full complement of staff there. And so I'm expecting an improvement in that area. Um, obviously, the introduction of the high-speed trains enable us to offer an improved food and drink offer that we uh, currently can't deliver from a trolley-based service. And we've got some really exciting plans for the intercity food offer uh, enabled by the fact that we have a, uh, a small kitchen on board so we can offer hot food for the first time. If, you, if it's a brief question. <clears throat> right, so Squire is uh, uh, independent inspectors. Do you agree or would you agree that some of these things, you know, I'm you know, astounded they're on, station posters, car parts and taxi ranks, train posters, why are they on or do you agree that some of these shouldn't be on here? Well, it's up to Transport Scotland to decide what it is they want us to deliver, and that's what they've done. And it's so called, what do you and it's a and a, and a taxi Well, rank. white lining, the fact that there's white lining in place, is there signage in place, is it clean, is it pothole free? All these, every single aspect of the service gets measured to a huge degree. And actually, that's a good thing. And that's what's underpinning the quality delivered by Scotland's railway. I thought I'd ask. I'm, I'm going to leave that there and, and move on to the next set of questions which come from John Mason. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. Um, Edinburgh Glasgow Improvement Project. Uh, I think probably really just two questions. Uh, there's the infrastructure and there's the rolling stock. So if we take infrastructure first, am I right in saying that everything is complete now except for Glasgow Queen Street Station? And can you tell us how we're getting on with Glasgow Queen Street Station? And especially, uh, I had a constituent came to me that, um, and then it was in the newspapers, that a building which was partly built might then be demolished uh, for something else. And I wonder if you could comment on that. Yeah, of course. So it's true to say that since December, the core electrification of the Edinburgh to Glasgow route has been completed and customers have been benefiting from faster, greener, longer trains on that route. Um, our services are not fully electric yet, that's why we need to finalise the testing of the Hitachi fleet so we can convert that route to full electric operation and that will enable us to cut the journey time even further and increase the number of seats. On Queen Street redevelopment, we're now on site. It is literally a building site and we're keeping the station open at the same time. We've nibbled away the 1970s 
uh, building on the front of George Square to reveal the grade listed shed. And um, the construction which your constituent um, uh, asks about relates to um, a retail development in the North Hanover Street site, which is just to the uh, east of the station. And uh, Scottish Government has recently taken a decision to go for a much bolder and more ambitious scheme for that site. And as a result, a small amount of work which has been done on that site will have to be changed. Okay, thank you. And completion for Queen Street? 2020. Right, that's fine. So then on to the uh, rolling stock. Um, maybe you can give us an update where we are with that. We understand there's been problems with windows or windscreens or whatever. Uh, so I'd be interested to hear how that's going. And um, I mean, I think the commitment at the moment is eight car trains and a 42 minute journey, or at least some of them at 42 minutes by the end of this year. So is that, are we still on course for that? Yeah, so there's two outstanding issues with the Hitachi trains. One is the windscreen and the other is the train's software. And during the testing program, uh, we uncovered an issue with the windscreen which saw some slight double imaging uh, at night, which is clearly a, a safety uh, issue. And so Hitachi has been working with its windscreen suppliers and alternative design those alternative designs to the windscreen are being fitted to the train this week. We will then bring the train to Scotland, retest it. Initial indications are that that windscreen uh, is much better than uh, its predecessor, and that will enable us to <coughs> do a campaign replacement of the windscreens. Can I just on press you on that point? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, Hitachi have been making trains, I think, for a long time. I mean, this is not a new thing. What, why has this become a problem? Well, it's a new train design. You know, this is not an off-the-shelf train. This has right, been okay. designed for us and for Scotland. Um, <clears throat> there are some uh, particular design characteristics of the train, which means that it's ended up with a curved windscreen. So, for example, these trains have what's called end gangways, where customers and staff can That's walk right. through the entire length of the train when they're coupled uh, together with each other. So, you know, this is the point of having a testing regime. You know, every single aspect of the train is tested. We test the design of the train, but we also test each train individually to make sure that it's fit for purpose before we put it into traffic for customers. Uh, software is the other issue, and we're reducing the number of outstanding software issues so that the software is reliable uh, enough for us to enter into um, passenger service. So we're expecting to introduce the Hitachi trains um, in the coming months. In terms of the journey time, so um, it, we'd like to deliver 42 minutes journeys on the brand new electric trains for this December. Um, it won't be it won't be every service at 42 minutes for this December. That comes the following year, but that's our aspiration. Um, clearly, that's dependent upon having the rolling stock from Hitachi to deliver. And uh, just for clarification, 42 minutes includes how many stops? Four. Right. Thank and you. And those trains are doing that under test right. um, already. Um, it's my aspiration that we do some line speed enhancement on that route to cut the journey time even further because these brand new electric trains reach 100 miles an hour in half the time of a diesel train. And the drivers are having to throttle back and therefore the train performance is outstripping that of the infrastructure. And I've said, well, let's be bold and let's be ambitious and see what can be done uh, to exploit the full performance of the train because it's impressive. Thanks very much. Um, Stuart. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, as uh, part of the... Uh, uh, re-equipping uh, the, the, the rail system, uh, you've released quite a lot of uh, 170s and therefore there are a number of short formed uh, units. Roughly how many of those are there? So um, we've lost um, six trains from the fleet uh, in recent months, um, <coughs> which is why we've hired in this fleet of 10 electric trains which will go into service in July um, but essentially you've got four critical services each day which used to be six car trains which are now three car trains which is causing 
crowding for our customers, which is something uh, we need to fix quickly. Um, so it's a morning peak into Edinburgh, it's a morning peak into Glasgow, and it's the same in the evening peak. So there's sort of four critical services uh, which we must fix as soon as we can. Um, just to clarify, I, I take it the six 170s have gone out have taken 36 carriages out, in other words, the six coach. How many does the 365, 10 365s so bring we, in? We, Two 158s have left the fleet, they're two car. Right, so that's four. Four 170s have left the fleet, they're three carriages. So We've actually been doing some work with our heavy maintenance programme to squeeze availability of the fleet to actually reduce the impact of that by net two. The 10 which we're bringing into traffic uh, on short term hire are electric trains uh, and they are four car trains. So my arithmetic therefore says, leaving aside the better exploitation of what you've got by changing maintenance, you've taken 16 carriages out and you're bringing 40 in. Yes. These short-term hires will more than replace the capacity we lost earlier this year. Right, that's fine. Um, and maybe just the, the, the other thing, you've, uh, in an attempt to redistribute some of the traffic, you've introduced lower fares on Edinburgh Glasgow via Airdrie. Uh, how successful has that been? Um, well, it's been very successful because customers have been benefiting from that lower fare. We implemented that in March. The reason why we did that was to encourage <coughs> customers that might have a choice of travelling between Edinburgh and Glasgow to take the via Airdrie Bathgate route so we can decongest the main Edinburgh Glasgow route via Falkirk High. Um, it's costing us a lot of money, but it was the right thing to do for customers. Okay, thank, thank you, Stuart. Uh, Peter, you're next. Yes, um, you know, once you get the, the, your new Hitachi trains in place and, one, and there's going to be ver various movements of trains, the old Intercity 125s are, are going to get a, an upgrade, I believe, and they are going to go back into service from May 2018 in, the, in Aberdeen, uh, Edinburgh line, is that correct? And how, are, how is that coming along? And, and is that... We're in May now, so is it, is it going to happen on time? And uh, can you tell us a wee bit about how this refurbishment of these trains are, are going forward? Yeah, sure. So the contractual commitment for the first high-speed train is June, and we're working hard with the heavy overhauler who's refurbishing the fleet um, at Doncaster to bring that train up to Scotland as soon as we can so we can start operating some preview services for customers. Um, I think it's fair to say that that project has been a challenge uh, and we're working very closely with them to get that train here as soon as we can. These trains are going to be thoroughly refurbished. Um, the, the trains have come off Great Western Railway. We are going to improve the quality of the seating, the seat pitch. We're going to line seats up with windows. We're going to introduce more tables. I've talked about the hot food offer. Um, to transform the quality and the capacity of those longer distance routes. Currently, you know, three and a half hour journeys on a three car diesel train will be transformed to uh, a four or a five car intercity train uh, with the engines at each end. So you get intercity levels of quality. I think it's going to transform the customer experience on those longer distance routes. So we're hoping to introduce the first service between Aberdeen and Edinburgh very shortly. It's unlikely to be this month. We've had some short delays with the heavy overhauler, but we're working as fast as we can to remedy that. Angus, I don't know whether you want to add to the HST programme. Yes, so I mean, as Alex touched on, it is a, a full refurbishment of the, uh, the internal ex in and external of the, the, the Intercity 125 or HST train. So things like, you know, all access toilets are being uh, fitted to them. A, a big um, thing is we'll not be having slammed door up here as they are down in uh, First Great Western. We're fitting um, new uh, electrically operated doors to the trains, which makes it better for passenger use and uh, better for dispatch time. So, you know, it is quite a comprehensive um, overhaul these trains uh, are getting when they come up here. They're actually, you know, the Mark III coach is a nice open space, uh, open field coach with, um, you know, a, a better environment for our customers between uh, our major cities in Scotland. 
You speak about the, the internal changes, you know, and that, that'll be fine. But what about mechanically? These, these trains have been in the go a long time. Are they, are they, do you get a mechanical overhaul at the same time? Is that part of the process? So part of it is, yes, is to replace some of the components. Uh, many of them are going through uh, major uh, heavy maintenance programmes and overhaul as well as the internals. So, I mean, the engines themselves are less than 10 years old, so they're not 40-year-old engines. They were re-engined a few years ago, and it's a fairly reliable replacement engine that's on board them. So, it's, you know, there's, there's more to it than just the, the, uh, the refresh of the, uh, the internals. What I would say is we've been running um, four driver training trains uh, across Scotland uh, for the last for several months now without problems or incidents. So, you know, that's bef so these are trains that have not necessarily had the full refurbishment yet, but still operating in Scotland, uh, training our drivers and our train crew up. Okay. Um, just, just for clarity, if I may, Alex, I ask you, you said it's unlikely to be May. Um, it is May. Um, so is it unlikely to be June or more likely to be July? Or is it likely to be June or July? Or is it likely to be this summer? When, I mean, do you have a date? So um, I'm not in a position to give a firm date because we're still working with Wabtec, the company doing the heavy overall, to make sure we've got a robust plan, plan to deliver the first refurbished train to Scotland. Originally, we wanted to go above and beyond the contractual date of June to deliver something for the timetable change in May. Sadly, that's now looking unlikely, but we're working with Wabtec to bring that first refurbished train as soon as, as, soon as we can. I can't make a firm commitment um, because but, but, but you will have had, with the greatest respect, an indication of when that's going to be. Uh, I'm trying to get an indication from you uh, when, when you think that will be. I think it's helpful for the, for the passengers that use that service to get a clue when that's going to be. So I, I would like you to try and answer that question with a bit more certainty than you've already given. Well, it's my aspiration that we put the first train into service in July but that is contingent upon the heavy overhauler uh, producing me a train which is fully refurbished. So, final part, aspiration July, likely August? Um, I'll I, leave it I, there I and move on to the next question, which is Mr Lyle. Well, I always used to say it'll be ready when it's ready. Um, rolling programme of electrification uh, I stay right beside the, I'll declare I stay right beside the Hollytown line um, at Hollytown Junction. So the electrification from Hollytown to Mid Calder Junction, when do you think that will be finished? Um, can you give us a progress update in the Shorts Line electrification project, including uh, are all the bridges now been raised? So the deadline for that project is uh, March of next year, and that project is on time and on budget. Uh, we learn a lot of lessons with the electrification of Edinburgh Glasgow electrification which we've applied to the electrification of the Shots line which is what we call your line uh, and also the electrification of Stirling, Dunblane and Alloa. The first section of Stirling, Dunblane and Alloa electrification is actually being switched on uh, as we speak. So uh, a really good news story there. In terms of all the bridges being raised, um, I'm not aware of any outstanding issues, but David, I don't know whether you've got any more no, detail. I'm, I'm not that. aware either, um, but we can easily I can clarify so that. So they've all, they've all went well. The, 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 the enhancement programme, from an infrastructure perspective in Scotland, is going very well indeed. So if you look at Aberdeen to Inverness, the rolling programme of electrification, the Highland mainline improvements, the redevelopment of Queen Street Station, all those projects are due to deliver their deadlines within the overall funding envelope. Okay, and uh, is there any hold back with Network Rail? Do they, are they working with you quite well in electrification? Well, we, together with the Alliance, we are Network Rail, we're yeah. Scott Rail and Network Rail working together. And I think the closeness of that relationship, running track and train together, is one reason why Scotland's railway outperforms that south of the border. I agree, thank you. Thank you. Uh, John Finney, the next question is with you. Thanks very much, Kavita. Good morning, panel. Uh, Mr. Hainsey, I'd, I'd like to ask you a question about the Highland Main Line, um, which will contain a reference to timetable. If you don't get to do deep, deeply, I would like to then ask you a supplementary specifically on the timetabling. And the question is around the ORR network rails monitor's suggestion there's a, a risk of the, the delivery of the 
Highland line, line improvements due to the lengthy timetabling process. Are you able to confirm uh, that uh, the predictions, predicted reductions in journey time, which was, and uh, I, I needn't remind you, but for the record, hourly services to the central belt and reduction in 10 minutes, and I think a challenging, uh, more, more efficient use of freight. Is that going to be delivered? So the, the Highland Main Line infrastructure will be delivered, which will improve the service on the Highland Main Line. Um, we're not able to absolutely confirm exactly the journey time and the stopping pattern, the frequency of the service on that uh, line of route because we need to check the way the trains are passed, particularly with freight, for example, which is why we're currently doing a consultation of what timetable could be possible on that line of route. So the infrastructure is um, on time and on budget, and we're doing a consultation about what train service, the fine detail of it, we can operate once that's complete. Okay, thank you for that answer. I, I, I was in touch and I'm very grateful to, to your staff for a response of an issue that's of concern to, to Kate, indeed to other colleagues and myself, about the implications. And if I could put it, the tensions between the aspiration to reduce journey times and yep. the expectations of communities, that they all benefit from that, but of course these journey times may be brought about by a reduced number of stops rather than... Uh, how, is, how is that all filtered together? I'm aware that there is ongoing consultation and that's, that yeah. is to be welcomed. But if you follow me, the, the tension that must be there... Yeah. Um, how can I mean, that be delivered? If yeah. I give you the very specific in the yeah. reply then, um, uh, and I'll not go into the detail, but an average of four people per day would board this particular train. And each day we would estimate that 350 to 400 people would be adversely affected later on. Is it always going to be a numbers game? Because, of course, the fear that we would have in the Highlands is yeah. that, you know, the larger numbers affected on the yeah. overall would be impact on yeah. the, the service of your phone. Yeah. No, I mean, we need to strike the right balance between frequency and journey time, which is not always easy, particularly on infrastructure, which is uh, constrained with single track sections, what have you, which is one reason why we're investing a lot of money on Scotland's railway to tack the you know, take these single track sections out because they really compromise your ability to provide a great train service. What we've seen over the years is um, the timetable evolve through time and um, what we're doing with the consultation is saying, well, the introduction of these high-speed trains gives us an opportunity to review um, what we might do to exploit the capability of these trains. What I would say is because the train fleet is getting that much bigger, we're going from 800 carriages in the fleet to 1,000 carriages in the fleet over the course of the next 18 months, what that will enable us to do is operate you know, the high-speed services you know, uh, between the Highlands and the Central Belt um, with faster journey times today. But because we have more carriages, we can also operate more um, semi-fast services as well. And so that is a change. We need to get it right. And that's why this consultation is so important. And, and can I ask, I mean, a, any improvements are welcome, but there's, there's been a reduction in what the initial proposal was just to see um, additional double tracking at um, Aviemore and Pitlochry. Does that in any way impact on that overall figure of wanting to reduce the reduction time and indeed the frequency of trains? compared to the original proposal, which was more doubling, as I understood? Um, no, I don't, I don't believe so. Um, you know, I think you know, timetables are very complicated things, and it's not just ScotRail services we have to accommodate, it's other operators, train services, and freight. And um, you know, inevitably, the timetable process means you know, compromises have to be made. And that's why we're doing this consultation. So, you know, if your constituents have got any concerns in this regard, I would really encourage them to take part in that and make their voice heard. And what we'll do is come up with the best um, uh, proposal which balances these competing priorities. A, a couple of final things on the Highland Mainline, then, please. It, there's a challenge there, increasing freight, as I understood pretty much at capacity as it is. Is, is, is that can be achieved? And are you in consultation with the... The, the, the freight companies? Yeah, so obviously we want um, Scotland's Railway to see more freight services. You know, freight in Scotland is actually down by 80% because we closed Long Annet 
coal-fired fire station. So that means we've got some capacity on the network which we can use for the markets. We're working with um, business and Scottish Government to develop new markets for rail freight and one specific opportunity uh, on that uh, line is working with Highland Spring to try and get their uh, produce on rail. That looks like a really good prospect which is great for freight on rail in Scotland but of course it does add to this capacity issue. Okay, thank you, Ed. A question, Mr. Finney, yeah, for me. Yeah, I'll, I'll roll two together. That, that consultation process finishes when, uh, Mr. Hines, and can you also give a brief update on the Inverness Aberdeen project, please, and if there are similar challenges there? So the consultation is currently live. I don't have an end date, but I can confirm that later with, with the committee. In terms of Aberdeen to Inverness project, um, that is currently on time and on budget, 330 million both to improve the train service between Aberdeen and Inverness, but also to improve the train service into Aberdeen and into Inverness. So really great commuter services for people to access employment there. We've completed the West End works, um, the track, the signalling, the new station at Forest, for example. We now move to the east end of the route and we've got a 14 week closure of the line between Dice and Aberdeen to enable us to deliver this work uh, as quickly as we can. We actually did a consultation with the communities on that line and said, would you like us to deliver this project over three years in the evenings at weekends with a number of shorter closures or would you prefer for us to have two um, bigger bang um, engineering closures and they very clearly chose the latter and so that work is being done in this 14 week blockade which has now just started. Okay, thank you very much. John, I mean, if you want to go back, it was quite a full answer on, on that. I'm happy to let well, you back in. Well, well on, on that particular in the closures, thank you. Uh, the, the, the issue of perhaps people getting used in 14 weeks to maybe going back in their car or, or finding alternatives. Well, how will you promote reuse of the train service after that? Because the, the potential is a, a loss, albeit you're going to bring in an enhanced service, I appreciate. Is that part of the programme? Yes, it will be. Um, we're doing more marketing. Um, than we've ever done before. We're doing better, better marketing, re-stimulating demand for rail travel is a key part of it. We've learned a lot of lessons about how to do that following the Queen Street closure and we'll be applying those in this case. Okay, thank you very much. Stuart, if you want to come in briefly and then I'd like to move um, to Kate. I just want to congratulate you because my Huntley to Linlithgow journey, even with a bus in it, has only lengthened by two minutes. And I think that's a, a master class in how to do the scheduling. Thank you. Uh, I think I'll leave that one there. Kate. Um, Hopefully this will be another master class. <laughs> but, um, um, oh, hold on, hold on. Sorry, sorry. Can, can, we, can we hear Kate's uh, question? Moving over to the West Coast further to John mm -hmm. Finney's questions, I'd like to ask a, a question on the West Highland line. Um, now, I understand that you are members of the new West Highland line review group, which will be looking at uh, timetabling and other improvements to infrastructure and getting some more investment into the line. Obviously, great opportunity to get cars off the A82 and to get freight off the A82 and huge potential with tourists who want to see iconic sites along that route. So what are your uh, plans when it comes to improvements to timetables and infrastructure on the line? Yeah, okay. So the first thing we're going to do is um, improve the quality of the rolling stock on that line. So um, the fleet which operates on that line currently, uh, they're called the Class 156, they're a diesel train, and we're thoroughly refurbishing that fleet and will have completed that investment programme by the end of next year. So um, new lighting, new seating, free Wi-Fi, power, etc., to create a thoroughly comfortable and modern environment. We're actually currently doing some work to see what infrastructure changes we would need to make on the West Highland line to operate a different type of rolling stock on that line uh, called the Class 158. And the, addition, uh, the added benefit of that is it has air conditioning. Um, 
the 158 train we've also refurbished to uh, improve the scenic nature of it by lining seats up with the windows. We're doing that on lots of uh, uh, parts of the line and indeed we're doing record m amounts of vegetation management to uh, remove trees from the immediate line side. Uh, it's good for safety, it's good for performance but it's also good for, for tourism as well. When I was up at Lock Arbor recently with the Transport Forum, they were very much saying to me what they wanted to see was additional train services. Um, other stakeholders have expressed a wish to me to improve journey time. Obviously the journey times by road are shorter than by train. And I really welcome the establishment of this review group because it will enable us to thrash through what the priorities for that line are and build a plan to do it. And if you look at the success we're having on the far north line, that shows you what can be done uh, when people have a, you know, a really strong vision of the potential of the railway. We invest to make it better and we're looking forward to doing the same on the West Highland line. So just to clarify, in terms of the rolling stock, improvements to the rolling stock, what are the time timetable, what's the time scales so for that? So all, all the existing rolling stock which operates on that line, that will all be refurbished by the end of next year. So every service will be operated with a, a refurbished 156. And in parallel, we're doing some work to see what changes would need to be made to the infrastructure to enable the operation of this higher quality train. Um, we have to make sure that the infrastructure and the train are compatible with each other, um, given that different trains are different sizes. So the trains will hopefully be operational by the end of 2019 with infrastructure prepared for it. So all the, the, the Class 156 fleet, which currently operate on that line, they are being refurbished as we speak. So every uh, month you use the service, you'll see more and more refurbished trains operating on that route. And by the end of next year, every single one will be refurbished. Um, on the infrastructure, that's what this review group is about, to see what are the priorities? Is it journey time? Is it frequency? Is it both? What improvements could we deliver uh, given some infrastructure? And then clearly we would need to work with Scottish Government to make a business case for that investment. Thank you. OK, thanks, Kate. Just before we, uh, I get Jamie in and then come to Gail Ross, if I may, you've mentioned on several occasions free Wi-Fi. Um, I think the Wi-Fi offer is, is actually to be commended, but there's still r large areas where you, when you're on the train, as I am, Tuesday and Thursday nights. I miss the Wi-Fi because the, it's not across all of your network. Can you just confirm that you are looking to make sure that you've got better coverage? Yeah. I'm not criticising what you've got at the moment. Yeah. I would just like to see it better. Yeah. So um, there's three things in the pipeline which will make Wi-Fi on Scott Rail better. Uh, first of all, as we renew the fleet and refurbish it, they all get fitted with free Wi-Fi. Secondly, um, that free Wi-Fi only works where there's a 3 or 4G signal available. And as of course, as mobile connectivity improves through the mobile operators, therefore the onboard experience will also get better. And we're also doing a trial uh, on our network with Cisco to see what we might do to fit actually one of the fastest Wi-Fi's uh, of any train anywhere in the world. And that trial is happening as we speak. Um, we're pretty excited by this prospect and we're, if it works, we will be coming forward with some proposals to Scottish Government about what we could do across the network. Thank you. Um, Jamie, you wanted to come in on other uh, uh, points relating to the experience. Jamie. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, panel, and uh, my apologies for missing the opening part of the session. Um, uh, just two uh, very distinct questions. Uh, one is around uh, what the panel's view is on how uh, ScotRail could uh, play a bigger part in promoting modal shift in Scotland. And by that, I mean, how do we get more people uh, off the road uh, onto trains uh, by improving things for, like, for example, bicycle parking at stations, car parking at stations, the capacity of bicycles on board, train carriages, etc. So any uh, news or updates or views that you have on that, I'd find quite helpful. Okay, thank you. Um, well, firstly, our, uh, our current marketing campaign specifically targets uh, road users. 
um, and highlighting the benefits of travelling by train, the fact that you can be uh, productive and use that time as you as you wish. Uh, and we've actually got some advertising hoardings on the side of lorries going round uh, congested Scottish cities as we speak to make that point whilst um, car drivers are uh, sat in traffic jams. In terms of making it easier to access the rail network, um, all the re rolling stock is being refurbished so it's fully accessible and that creates uh, flexible space so we can uh, uh, improve the number of bikes we can get on trains. We have a big investment program to improve the number of car parking spaces across the network and indeed cycle spaces. Um, so, you know, we have a transport integration strategy and a manager, we're putting investment into this area. And it's also fair to say that in this five year control period, uh, which Network Rail is regulated by, uh, we're actually due to underspend here in <coughs> Scotland, which is uh, a great achievement and is in part uh, as a result of the fact that the investment programme is on time and on budget and these investments are handing back contingency because they don't need it. And we're looking to see what can be done quickly in the next 12 months to um, sort of upgrade the already investment programme in car parking to create more spaces. So, um, you know, improving the accessibility of the railway is a key part of our strategy because with the additional seats we've got and the additional frequencies, we'll actually have 40% more seats to sell. It's supplementary and then I'm going to bring Gail Ross. <clears throat> yeah, sure. Um, I, I, maybe I'll park the <clears throat> potential supplementary on underspend if someone else wants to pick that up. I'll move on to my other question. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I just wondered what... Um, Mr. Hines' views were on the uh, recent headlines uh, from the uh, rail delivery group and other passenger user groups around the complicated ticketing system that exists in the UK. Apparently there are 55 million combinations of tickets in the UK and they're calling for a root and branch review of, uh, and reform of the system. Do you think that there should be reform of, uh, of ticket pricing uh, in the UK and what sort of changes do you think would best benefit the commuter? I think it's certainly something we should uh, take a look at because when I talk to customers, they find the fares and ticketing system very complicated. Um, so, you know, a great example for that was last week I was at a public meeting in Elgin where if you're travelling between Elgin and the Central Belt, you can either go via Inverness or Aberdeen. It's a different fare. Uh, if you split the ticket, um, you get a cheaper price. This is difficult for, to explain to customers. So essentially what we have is a fares and ticketing system is, is the same as it was 20 years ago, um, adjusted for inflation. And um, there are definitely, I think, opportunities for us to make fares and ticketing simpler for customers to understand, which would be good for them because then they would use the train more often. Gail, you've got a supplementary. I do. Um, thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. You talk about accessibility, and um, we've been hearing in my other committee that I'm a member of that um, people with disabilities have difficulties accessing the system um, sometimes, and, and people with physical disabilities getting on and off trains, but also people with um, sight impairments um, accessing timetables and things like that. How do you propose to address these issues? So every single train in the fleet will be fully accessible by the end of next year. So they'll have audio and visual information systems to help uh, sight impaired people. They'll have disabled toilets, for example. Obviously, we have two people on board every train in Scotland. So that helps provide greater assistance for those people who need a bit more help. We have an accessibility forum um, where groups representing um, certain uh, categories of customers who might need a bit of extra help can work with us to improve the service that we provide. So um, we've already got big investment programmes to improve the accessibility of the network and we work with lots of groups to um, do even better on this agenda. Uh, it's a big opportunity for us. Um, the challenge, of course, is stations. 
Um, but that's why every time we go in and we invest in new station infrastructure like Forest, like Glasgow Queen Street, we make it fully accessible, we build it to the latest accessibility standards to make sure that Scotland's railway is accessible to all. Um, I'm going to briefly let you come in, John, uh, but I would ask you if you could keep it as brief as possible. It's a, it's a very short supplementary, and I, I hope I heard Mr Hines correctly, but um, with two people on board every train, Mr Hines, is this, is this a, a, an announcement you're telling us that you're going to reverse the driver only operating the, um, so, in some in the Strathclyde area? Yeah, so in Strathclyde area, uh, we have driver only operation, which means that the train is capable of being operated without a second person on board. Uh, we roster a ticket examiner on board uh, every one of those trains. And a recent area of focus for myself, Angus, and the team has been to make sure we reduce the number of services, only a handful each day, which actually run without a ticket examiner. And we've been working with our staff and our trade unions to improve our performance in this area, which is measured by Squire, which forms part of our Squire improvement plan. But that's not a safety critical guard? It's not, no. Okay, thank, um, you. thank you, John. And the final question, Gail Ross. Thank you. Um, you'll be aware that consumer organisation, which recently raised concerns about how passengers access the delay repay compensation scheme. <laughs> Had to say that one slowly. Um, in light of these concerns, are you going to look at the way that scheme is operated? And do you have any plans to make compensation automatic? So we proactively push delay repay um, in terms of when we have train service disruption, we uh, say to customers, you are entitled to delay repay. This is how you claim it. Um, the industry, not just ScotRail, but the industry has recently changed the national rail conditions of carriage to reflect the Consumer Rights Act. So uh, in the past, it was the case that you got your delay repay and there was no consequential loss. We've changed the national rail conditions of carriage, which apply to ScotRail, which say that if you have suffered a consequential loss, you're free to uh, make a claim and we'll consider it on its merits. And um, there's a couple of things we're looking at to further improve the compensation scheme for customers. Um, in some other places, they're actually paying it at a lower threshold, so 15 minute delay rather than 30. And the other is, as you say, some operators make it automatic. And we're doing a piece of work at the moment to see what could be done here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and that brings us to the end of this session. I'd like to thank you, Alex, for coming in, and Angus and David for, for giving evidence to this committee. Uh, I'm now going to briefly suspend the meeting for five minutes to allow the changeover of witness. Thank you.
Good morning again. We are now going to move on to agenda item three, which is the salmon farming in Scotland inquiry. I'd like to welcome Donald Cameron and Graham Day from the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Welcome. I would also like to ask members to declare at this stage any interest. I would like to declare that I have an interest in a wild fishery and I have made a full declaration of my interests at the start of this inquiry. Would anyone else like to make a declaration of interest? Donald. Thank you, Convener. Can I um, refer to the declaration I made on the 5th of March uh, with reference to both a fish farm and a wild fishery? Thank you. Um, this is our sixth evidence session on the Committee's Salmon Farming in Scotland inquiry, and the Committee will now take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy and Connectivity with his officials. I'd like to welcome Fergus Ewing, the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy and Connectivity, Mike Palmer, the Deputy Director, Alistair Mitchell, the Head of Aquaculture and Recreational Fisheries, and Charles Allen, the Head of the Fish Health Inspectorate. Cabinet Secretary, would you like to make a brief opening statement, please? Good morning, Convener and uh, Committee members. I'm very grateful for the chance to address you today with, with my officials. I am, as you all know, a very strong and public advocate for the aquaculture sector in Scotland and for the many benefits and opportunities it brings and will continue to provide for the people of Scotland. I've been following the inquiry and the report by Eclair Committee, which has brought uh, sharply into focus many of the issues that we as government have been working with the sector to resolve. I think we should acknowledge the sector has come a long way from where it was and things have not been standing still by any means. The message coming from us, from science and indeed from the industry itself, from whom I believe uh, members heard last week, echoes the message from the Eclair report that the current status quo is uh, not acceptable. I come here today on the back of a number of significant developments, convener, many of which have been in train for uh, some time, but have been progressed against the backdrop of the two committee inquiries and also expectations on the way forward. Uh, and these include, briefly, uh, a commitment to look at the potential for an alternative consenting regime that addresses concerns from local planners and environmental groups around the current planning regimes and some of the areas of dispute concerning the applicability of the precautionary principle. I also see this examining question around the way in which the, differ the differing regulatory regimes mesh with each other, a theme which has featured already during this inquiry. Secondly, an agreement with the sector to sustainably manage the capture of wild wraths used as cleaner fish. Thirdly, a new permitted development order to bring more transparency to changes in routine husbandry in aquaculture. As I've outlined at the Aquaculture Industry Leadership Group, we shall be establishing an independently chaired working group to look innovatively at how we move the dialogue around the interaction between wild and farmed salmon against the backdrop of diverging and sometimes inconsistent science. And finally, in autumn last year, I made a commitment in our programme for government to work with the sector to develop a farmed fish health framework in order to address many of the health issues highlighted in the Eclair report. And, Convener, I can say that we expect the framework document shall be ready for publication relatively soon. This framework provides a clear message that we are determined uh, to ensure the challenges of health and disease are addressed both in the immediate and the long term. It demonstrates that we are constantly working to improve how the salmon sector operates because we fully support the industry's ambitions. But let us be clear here that we do not accept growth at any expense. Growth must be sustainable growth. That reality is not lost in the sector, for they too have a, a reliance and an economic vested interest in our natural landscape and surroundings. Uh, indeed, however you look to quantify the recognised Scottish premium, uh, the environment is one, if not the most important, of its component parts. I've come today in the hope that collectively we can agree both on the importance of aquaculture convener to the Scottish economy, but also how we might best resolve some of the concerns and reservations that others retain. And I do believe we can resolve that conundrum without detriment or conflict. Aquaculture has received considerable attention of late, a testament to its continued success story and 
the accompanying additional public scrutiny that naturally travels alongside. And it has received significant public criticism, some understandable, but much unevidenced and emotive in language. In closing, I hope that you will agree the work we have been doing and the work we are to do amounts to a rigorous commitment to the environmental sustainability of the salmon farming sector in Scotland and that by getting all parties around the table, we will ensure that everyone's voice is heard. And the outcome of the committee process will have a significant impact on all concerned, and we should recognise that we all have a responsibility to get that right. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, thank you very much, and thank you for your opening remarks. And I'm very pleased that you clarified uh, in your opening remarks the environmental statement. I have to say, as convener of this committee, I was slightly concerned when I heard you quoted to say I was determined to give leadership, or you were determined to give leadership, and that you could make sure no matter what challenges were thrown at the industry, you would double growth. And that seemed an odd comment to make when two co committees of this parliament were in the process of carrying out a review. So I'm glad you've clarified that position today, and I would ask Kate to ask the first question, please. Thank you very much, Convener. We have learned in this committee that salmon is the most popular fish in the UK shopping basket, and we obviously hear regularly about the fantastic export figures for Scottish food and drink. How important is that Scottish brand for Scottish uh, farm salmon, and how important is the perception that um, farm salmon has been produced in a, a pristine environment to high standards? Uh, let me first of all say, Convener, that in the uh, report you referred to was inaccurate uh, and incomplete, and I made clear in the course of the remarks that I gave in that speech, uh, which was over in Brussels, that I support sustainable growth. Uh, I made that absolutely clear, and that we must overcome the challenges. To answer the member's question, it's extremely important. It's extremely important because um, salmon is uh, our biggest export in terms of food, because Salmon has, I believe, the lowest carbon footprint uh, of all major foodstuffs, and that's something I think it's very important to stress. It's important because of its nutritious or nutrition value, and I'm no expert, but all the experts tell me that it is one of the most nutritious foods available, uh, and it's important because I think that we do have the capacity of achieving the targets that the industry has. They're not government targets, they're industry targets. But as been emphasized, and I believe last week by the industry panel, um, they're not either in support of growth at any cost. We all recognize that the significant challenges, which I fully expect we'll come on to discuss at length today, as is absolutely correct, these must be overcome. There is some evidence, I think, convener, that and you heard this last week, uh, one company mentioned the reduction of sea lice numbers by 87% in adult females, for example. Um, there is some evidence that uh, the vast investment and effort collectively being made by the public and private sector in Scotland is overcoming these challenges. But I do want to emphasise right at the beginning, it's very important to me that we recognise we face these things head on as we have been doing. We carry on the work that we've put in train that Rosanna Cunningham and I highlighted in our statement in March last year. But we do want to be bold and ambitious, and we do want to, to achieve the food and drink standards or targets set by the industry of doubling the value of food exports to a food, a food and drink sector as a whole to 30 billion by 2030. And if we are to do that, convener, I'll finish with this, if we are to do that, then it's, it's only logical and correct that Scottish salmon, with the high premium it carries, the high regard it has, the highest regard in the world of any country. It's logical and I think important that we start off with the view that we want to enable that to happen by working together to overcome these challenges. Yeah, uh, there's a brief supplementary from Gail Ross, the Deputy Convener. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Cabinet Secretary, we heard a lot in previous evidence sessions about the um, benefits to the rural economy. And uh, we had um, specific reports from HIE and Marine Scotland that gave us stats about that. Um, one good example is Migdale Smoltz in my constituency. But I wonder if you could briefly touch on how you think um, aquaculture benefits the rural economy. Well, at the, the macro uh, level, it, it contributes enormously with uh, supports over 12,000 jobs 
and contribute £620 million a year to, to, the, uh, to the economy. Uh, uh, but I gather that evidence has been received by the committee about you know, the hidden but huge impacts on communities throughout uh, Gail Ross's constituency, throughout Kate Forbes' constituency, throughout the Highlands and the Islands in particular, but also on the supply chain, where I think Stuart Graham said that for every uh, work in primary, it supported five jobs in the supply chain. But, um, you know, I'm acutely conscious, having represented formerly La Haber, now represented by Kate Forbes, that, you know, communities like La Halen are sustained by, by fish farming. That uh, the, the evidence from Inverlusa Marine Services based on Mull, they're employing 70 people. Uh, that uh, the, the Migdale example, uh, I think, was given by Gail Ross as a, a Boner Bridge company, which has 17 full-time employees, gross staff pays in the region of £600,000. Um, without, if aquaculture were not to exist, then many rural communities in the West Highlands and in the Northern Islands would be imperiled because they would lose people to the auxiliary fire service. They would lose children who are attending uh, small schools in rural areas. So I'm absolutely passionate and an advocate that aquaculture over the last five decades has been an enormous benefit to these communities. And I, I think we don't hear that side of the story convener enough. So I'm very grateful for the opportunity just to give a few examples, but there could be hundreds more examples. And just finish with this, that I was involved in, in respect of the, the tragic death of two fishermen in the Nancy Glen, and uh, a third fisherman uh, was rescued uh, in an act of uh, a outstanding bravery, and that was in part because of a passing fish farm, a passing fish farm vessel. So in all sorts of hidden ways, uh, this industry is making an enormous contribution, uh, and sometimes I wish we would hear more about that in the public reports about this sector. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I just remind all committee members and indeed the Cabinet Secretary, there is an awful lot of ground we wish to cover today. And that is the first question, which has taken 15 minutes. We would still, at that rate, be here by, uh, I think, 4.30, 5 o'clock this evening. So I would ask everyone, please, to, to make sure their answers and questions are as focused as, prop, as, as possible. Peter, yours is the next question. Yeah, well, with that in mind, um, there is a great desire, a great will for this sector to grow, both by government and by the industry itself. And the industry's figures are projected to grow from 162,000 tonnes to 210,000 tonnes by 2020. Um, but that has to be done sustainably, as you have already said, the Cabinet Secretary. There is a huge demand for this, for this product, but there are environmental issues. The status quo, I think we've all accept, uh, accepted, is unacceptable. So has the Scottish Government adopted industry growth targets without a robust assessment of the environmental carrying capacity for increased growth? And if you have done that assessment, where is it? Well, first of all, as I said earlier, we, have, we haven't adopted as government targets the industry targets. And that's an important distinction that I would ask members to bear in mind. We are supportive of the industry achieving its potential. And in that regard, I would point to the evidence that was last week received, I think, from one of the panel who, who said that doubling growth doesn't necessarily mean doubling numbers. Uh, we're looking to increase value. The value added of smoked salmon produce is enormous, and it's growing. Uh, all of us know that from the produce, the high-quality produce that we see on the shelves of retailers. Uh, so it's not simply about doubling stock numbers. But secondly, we are absolutely in favour of uh, uh, the various techniques which are being used in order to seek growth, but to do so sustainably. For example, last week, one of the contributors said that they formerly had, I think, 33 fish farm sites, but that's been reduced very substantially. They've gone, they've changed the model. They've changed the location of sites. They've changed the practices, which no doubt we will come on to. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we are supportive of, uh, of growth, but it must be sustainable, Mr Chapman. And, uh, you know, I recognise that you as a, as a farmer have got the same concerns on land as the, the representatives from whom we heard last week have on sea in farming about overcoming the mortality challenges. I, I found their, 
their evidence extremely impressive and absolutely sincere. Uh, and impressive in, in the sense that, you know, in some respects, not all of them, some respects, the challenges are being overcome uh, uh, and uh, sea lice numbers are now at the lowest since 2013, for example. That didn't happen by accident, but precisely because of, of the efforts and investment being made. So, I mean, that's basically, you're saying there hasn't been a government assessment of the environmental carrying capacity of, of the industry as it grows. I mean, there, there is no work being done to assess? No, I didn't say that at all, uh, but to, to answer that point, maybe Mr Palmer could provide some more factual evidence. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to um, uh, say that um, the various regulatory agencies um, constantly um, are looking to review the assessments that they make and the kind of um, analyses and modelling that they can put in place in order to ensure that there is sufficient environmental protection to support the growth um, uh, aspirations of the sector. So, for example, SEPA, as I think you've heard in previous evidence, um, have been developing uh, depositional zone regulations, um, which will take us on quite substantially from the previous approaches um, to monitoring discharge into the water column. Um, similarly, we have the Scottish Shelf Model, um, which is um, uh, a new approach to hydrodynamic modelling, which is going to, in a much more precise way, help us to predict various different tidal flows um, uh, and, and, and water energy flows. All of these initiatives, which we constantly work on um, in Marine Scotland, in Marine Scotland Science, and with the different regulators that we collaborate with, um, are constantly being developed. Um, they are being discussed with the sector um, so that we can create an enabling environment for sustainable growth, but it has to be sustainable, and everybody's very clear about that. Uh, but in a way, this is a reflection and an expression of the adaptive management approach that I know has featured in previous uh, sessions of this inquiry. Um, so it's a constantly changing uh, picture in, in terms of the modelling that we can put in place and therefore the assessments that we can make with our regulatory partners. Mm. Perhaps if I could just, just add to that. Um, each, uh, I, I am conscious it, it, that everyone would like to, put, to, to say something. I'm very happy to try and bring as many people as, in as possible. If I just remind witnesses that it, it is up to me to bring people in. So Alistair, would you like to add briefly Sorry. to that? Yeah, just, just to add briefly that every um, new farm or major expansion of a farm does undergo an environmental impact assessment as part of the planning approach. So that considers, alongside all the statutory authorities, the ability of that particular water body to uh, accommodate that, um, that development. If you'd like to come just, back on that, and then one, I'd like to bring in John yeah, Finney. I mean, just one final question on that. I mean, in the panel's view, what, what are the key challenges to grow in this industry? Well, Start off well I'll, I'll pass to visuals, but I mean, in, in brief, the, the key challenges are overcoming um, the disease and mortality issue. That's the number one challenge, and I think that's what you heard last week in evidence as well. Mm. Do officials want to expand on that? going to come on to those specific topics uh, maybe uh, uh, shortly. So maybe I can bring in John Finney at this stage, because um, I think you've got a supplementary on that. Um, th thank you very much, uh, convener. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary panel. Cabinet Secretary, um, if you would indulge me, convener, I'd like to read a very small quote from one of the bits of evidence we got. It's from the Fisheries Management Scotland. They say the growth target, as, as you confirmed, they say the growth targets included within the aquaculture growth to 2030 are industry targets. They're not government targets, albeit that you've indicated, if, if I noted you correctly, your support of them. There has been no assessment of the environmental sustainability of these targets, nor have they been subject to st strategic environmental assessment. The report only includes passing mention of the environmental challenges facing the industry and no mention at all of wild fisheries interactions. And this is, again, Fisheries Management Scotland. We do not consider the industry growth target should be adopted by the Scottish Government or included in the National Marine Plan without a robust assessment of the environmental carrying capacity for increased growth, including fish farms. Captain Secretary, I agree with you. I represent a, a large rural area, and the value of these jobs is immense, and the wider implications of not just the jobs in the farm, but, the, but surely the precautionary principle must apply 
you, you acknowledged earlier on that the status quo isn't acceptable. Indeed, there's been many measured comments uh, about this. Um, you've said the challenge, if, again, if I noted you correctly, just as the convener came to me, overcoming disease and mortality is the issue. Does that not all lead to a position where you should be calling for an immediate moratorium and expansion um, pending resolution of these issues? Well, uh, first of all, we, we already do apply the precaution principle. And secondly, we take, uh, in our approach, we take an evidence-based approach. Um, Mr. Palmer has already said that, that any ap application for consent for a new farm must undergo environmental assessment. Thirdly, and again this was stressed in, in evidence before the committee before, a huge amount of work has been done in modelling. And Mr Palmer began to, to talk about that work. It's very, very important work. And that modelling is in the form of uh, assessment. Fourthly, the, the production in a, the most uh, a prolific producer of uh, farm salmon in the world in Norway is massively greater than ours. And, and I think it can be demonstrated, therefore, that greater production can be done uh, sustainably. And finally, uh, I mean, I think I should emphasize that the industry has set out figures by which it seeks to achieve by 2030. Um, I, I'm not sure that they've set them out as, as tablet, in tablets of stone as targets. I think the word aspirations was used. Uh, you would have to check the record, uh, but I think that's what Mr. Graham said in his evidence last week. So. In all of these points, I, I think we're really doing what Mr Finney is, or we're already doing what Mr Finney is asking us to do, and the further evidence about the action that we've taken um, since this government came into power, for example, in, a, in tightening up various parts of the regulatory framework, demonstrates our desire to, 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 take, to take these things head on. I don't know if officials would, I mean, it's a very important question, but I certainly don't think the moratorium uh, would be justified, and I do contend that we apply the precautionary principle already, and maybe the officials could expand on that convener usefully. It's got a supplementary to that, which, which may add and allow the officials to come in uh, to answer both questions at the same time, All Cabinet right. Secretary. So, well, John. Convener, it's a follow-on to, to Mr Chapman's. Um, you said they aren't the government's targets, Cabinet Secretary, but you said you're supportive of these targets, and you said you take an evidence-based approach, but it's, you don't deny that there isn't an environmental sustain, sustainability assessment made of these targets, nor a strategic environmental assessment. That doesn't seem to be adopting either the precautionary principle or evidence-based approach to, dis, to policy making. No. no, no, I've made it absolutely clear that we're not, and I said this just right at the outset, and uh, it's on the record, that we're not in favour of growth at any cost. We're in favour of sustainable growth. And I've also said that we must overcome the challenges and uh, the work what, what I feel, convener, is that the work which has already been done and is being done to overcome these challenges needs to be looked at factually and forensically. And those who do that will come to the conclusion, as I have done, uh, that success is being achieved, but there is more to be done. And these, these are the immediate tasks ahead, uh, I, as I see it in general policy terms. Um, again, I think it probably would be useful if officials could add more, more factual background, convener, if that's permissible. Mike, would you want to come in on that? Yes, just to say that um, in terms of the precautionary principle, that is embedded at all levels in, in all that we do as regulators. Um, so it's embedded at the national level in terms of how we take forward policy. It's embedded within the planning system. It's embedded within SEPA's approach and the approach from Scottish Natural Heritage. And um, any regulator that, that touches um, upon aquaculture or indeed any impact on the environment. Um, so that, that, that principle is very much um, alive and kicking and something that we, that we cherish very much and um, is at the heart of our approach to sustainable growth. In terms of environmental assessments, um, as my colleague um, Alistair Mitchell has commented, um, there is an environmental impact assessment that, that is a part of each planning application. So that occurs at a local level. Um, in terms of about the growth element, I do understand what will take place in respect of each individual application. It's the dearth of evidence in respect of the government's support for this growth target. So we have made clear as a government that we are supportive of um, uh, the growth target um, uh, as a target that would be achieved sustainably. So we would not be supportive um, of uh, growth at any cost. 
Um, it has to be growth that is balanced with the protection of the environment. And uh, I, I might refer the committee to the joint policy statement that was issued by um, Mr Ewing and Ms Cunningham uh, last year on aquaculture, which made very clear that we take a balanced uh, balance view around sustainable growth. And that is the message that we've given the sector. Um, and I think you've heard about the Aquaculture Industry Leadership Group, which uh, Mr Ewing sits on. And uh, in, in that group um, is, uh, has a remit um, of bringing all the key regulators and government and the sector together um, to work out um, how we can create an enabling environment for sustainable growth towards those targets. Um, and uh, uh, on that group, uh, we have made very clear, and the sector have, have welcomed the message that we've given them that um, we need to find um, and, and improve and constantly enhance the regulatory approach that we take um, in order to ensure that um, the environment is protected as we move towards those aspirations that the sector has. John, thank you. Very uh, much. you ha uh, yes, I'm conscious of a lot of other questions. I'll leave it there. Okay. Thank you. I think maybe we'll move on to the next question, which is uh, Kate Forbes. Thank you very much. And I want to touch on mortalities. And obviously, with any livestock production, there will be a level of mortality. But the mortalities appear to have increased from 2014 to the present day when it comes to fish farming. And a farmed fish health framework, I understand, is being developed by the industry in partnership with the Scottish Government, with the support of all salmon farming companies setting out a strategic framework of high-level fish health objectives for the next 10 years to underpin the sustainable growth of Scottish aquaculture. When will that uh, framework be published and will it be compulsory or voluntary and what is the Cabinet Secretary's view in how this um, health framework can help to reduce mortalities? Um, well, the, the Farmed Fish Health Framework is a programme for government commitment which I, I made, I think, last year and which we're about to implement very shortly. Uh, it will be published relatively soon. Um, it will include uh, a commitment, this is relevant to your question, to present the annual mortality rates in the fish farming industry by cause. Uh, and obviously, uh, we all wish to drive down the mortality rates and ideally a mortality rate of zero is what any farmer land or sea would aspire to whether it's farm salmon whether it's lambs whether it's uh, uh, dairy cattle but you know sadly life shows that that's extremely challenging but the fish health framework will take this head on in in that particular respect and uh, will it be voluntary or compulsory um, well, we, we already have a statutory underpinning of regulations, which, um, uh, which of course, uh, we look at continuously. And of course, there may be ways in which the regulatory and consenting system can be improved, as the First Minister uh, opined recently, and we're keen to look at that. So we have an open mind on that, and a lot of work has been done on that, as no doubt we may come to in other questions. Uh, but there's a certain amount of, of uh, work we can do with the statutory underpinning by legislative action uh, uh, and I think an awful lot more work we can do by best practice and I think it has been said in evidence that the code of practice, the technical standards that we produced in Scotland have been regarded as leading in the world but we don't want to rest on our laurels in the past. This is a dynamic, a fast moving uh, uh, situation as we've heard from witnesses so we have to ensure that the response uh, statutory and voluntary is uh, uh, complement each other and are effective. The substance of the draft framework, you mentioned there would be a requirement to publish data. Will there be other regulatory requirements that are new for the sector? Um, well, the, the, the focus areas for the framework, I mean, will come as, as no surprise and we'll probably cover all these things. So I'll just summarise, I'll just mention them briefly because I imagine we may well, in questions, come on to them. But... The information flow, the transparency, the industry wants to be more transparent, uh, and that is necessary. The gill health issue is paramount, sea lice issue, obviously. Cleaner fish, I've already mentioned. The production cycle and on-farm management, the licensing regime and medicine use, and climate change. So these are some of the areas that uh, would be in areas of focus of the um, 
framework, and for each key work stream which will be done in these areas, a group will be established to take forward the, the work. So, um, so prior to the establishment of the two parliamentary inquiries, a work was well underway on the framework, which is near completion, and it will cover all of these areas, and rightly so, because we are determined that working as Team Scotland, public and private sector and regulators and researchers, that we tackle these significant challenges effectively. Secretary, uh, before we move on to the next set of questions, it would be a, very helpful for the committee if I could uh, ask you, I believe, when this high-level farmed fish health framework will be delivered. You have said, I think the words were shortly, nearly completed. Uh, we've, we've got a, a report to consider, and it would be very helpful to know whether th that we'll be in a position to consider this high-level farmed fish health framework during the consideration of our report. Well, relatively soon is the phrase that I used. It was the phrase that I did use quite deliberately, so relatively soon. Right, okay, so I'm not clear on that one, I'm sorry. Stuart, yours is the next question. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, convener. And I am narrowly want to look at uh, sea lice. It, it's maybe worth just saying that I, as a member of the Eclair Committee and this committee, uh, I view uh, the, the work of the two committees really as being one, uh, one, uh, one inquiry, perhaps rather than two, albeit there will be publication in various reports at different times. Um, the Eclair Committee unanimously made pretty clear uh, what it was looking for the industry to deliver uh, in the way of uh, data uh, about uh, female sea lice. Um, welcoming the increased data that's coming from the industry, nonetheless, it's still running substantially in arrears. It doesn't give fish numbers uh, in farms, uh, and that makes it very difficult to normalize the data, enable independent researchers uh, to look at that. So, in relation to the government, is the government working with the industry to try and uh, meet the kind of standards that the Eclair Committee laid out in its contribution to this inquiry, but perhaps even more fundamentally, uh, getting us to a position that the Norwegian industry seems to be in, where there is a real-time, or virtually real-time, uh, view uh, of uh, what's happening in relation to sea lice and, indeed, diseases more generally. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I, I think the industry is, uh, is absolutely keen to be as transparent as possible. As I understand it, Mr Lansborough last week uh, said that, the, the, uh, that further reportage uh, is being delivered. Uh, however, I think Mr Stevens is right to say that uh, the report is just not quite as up-to-date as in Norway, and I think last week, convener, you brandished a sheet of paper which Spice had extracted as an example of the information which could be available from a website for a particular Norwegian um, a, a farm. Um, I think Scott Lansborough, as I, if I understood him correctly, said the information is published for every farm, but three months in arrears, uh, but is now published or to be published on a monthly basis as opposed to a quarterly basis. So. That I think the industry are on a journey and, and have a desire to be as transparent as possible. We want them to be as transparent as possible, and so we're working with them on that. Um, Kavina, at some point, I thought it might be useful if Mr. Allen, who is head of the Fish Health Inspectorate and who really, therefore, is dealing day and daily with all of this, might be able, to, with permission from yourself, Kavina, to run through a brief description of the regulatory regime and how it operates, because. I, I did feel with the, the time we've got that might be a very useful piece of evidence to get into your record with your permission. Uh, can I just Mr. Allen might address this. I very specifically uh, asked about what the government's doing, and I think I'm about to hear it, but I specifically think uh, I'd like to hear what the government is doing to help uh, the industry raise their game in this respect, because I think the government may have a role in this. If you conclude it doesn't, then let's hear that that's the case. You, should we bring in Charles uh, at this stage to hear, to hear what he's doing, and then if you want to add briefly, Cabinet Secretary, okay. and Charles, if I could ask you to, to, to come in briefly on that. I think I would firstly like to say um, the, the trick that is to be gained is to make sure any data which is published 
is correct and accurate. Uh, unfortunately, that does take some time, uh, which would explain part of the time lag. Um, we are considering how we publish uh, our own data, and indeed we will be seeking to publish uh, information collected under the regulatory regime separately to that of industry. So there will be more than one set of data available. Um, but at a higher level, um, the farm fish framework is seeking to address um, the provision of data on sea lice. Um, and, and, oh. and I'm sure Stuart wants to come back again. So maybe, maybe we could see if we could take the two together. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, just to follow on this theme, I, I, I find the, the language being used quite troubling. Uh, why are we coming at this from the view that it's up to industry to mark its own homework in this respect? Why isn't government taking the lead, as, as is the case in Norway, where data is not just as real-time as it can get, the quality of the data is good, but we're not just using data to be reactive to what may have gone wrong. They're using big data in a very meaningful way to actually make future decisions and improvements uh, in as real time as possible. So I have a worry that we're, we're looking at this from a point of view that the government will help industry rather than why isn't the government taking leadership in the regulatory environment around this very important data? Take Stuart in as well, and then, and then Stuart. Um, I just heard Mr. Allen say the government's going to be publishing figures as well. And I just have a very narrow question there. Really, don't we need to get to a position where there's just one set of figures that we can all rely on? And that perhaps the, the independence that comes from figures that come through the regulatory process um, might be what the government would uh, like to tell us is the destination we're going for. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, do you want to come in on that? I think Mr Power wants to come in as well. Okay. Yes, I, I want to take us back to the, to the farm fish framework, and I know that's frustrating for the committee because um, uh, you, you've not um, uh, uh, yet seen it and it's not um, quite ready to be published yet. But uh, as the Cabinet Secretary said before, um, that is uh, perhaps the very first focus of that framework. It's transparency and data flows and making sure... Um, that we are working with the industry and that we are taking um, a, a leadership role there as a government with the industry uh, uh, to um, improve the uh, transparency of data. Um, and as the Cabinet Secretary said, to go on that journey um, to enhance the real-time nature of that as, as quickly as we can. Um, it's a big step forward um, uh, that has recently been taken to get um, uh, farm level uh, uh, sea lice data on a monthly basis, um, uh, which the industry have undertaken uh, to provide and has just been provided in its first edition. We will then work through the delivery of the fish farm, frame, the farm fish framework um, to um, take further steps with the industry on that, and the government will be very much at the heart of that um, uh, and, and, and leading um, that process. Stuart, do you want to come back? Um, let me just clarify what Mr Palmer has just said. He said two things which I could imagine are in conflict. Government will be very much at the heart of that and then immediately said government will be leading. Now, which is it? Because I, I think they're two different things. And I think I would like the government ultimately to be publishing figures which the government says these are figures published with our imprimatur for which we take responsibility. Is that the destination we're going to? The government is leading on this and we have made it clear to industry uh, in the various uh, forums that in which we engage that uh, transparency uh, is something that we require. And it's heartening to see, as you've heard last week, that the industry is listening and acting and improving the level of, of data. And that's absolutely right. But I did say we're on a journey, and we're not at the journey's end yet. And we've heard from Mr. Allen, who is the head of the FHI, that the data must be accurate. So. Uh, the industry is now responding to our lead that there must be greater transparency. I don't think there's actually an issue here. From what I heard, 
from what I know, from the dealings I've had, from the work I've done over the past nearly two years in this job, uh, the industry is determined to be more transparent than it has in the past. There are some concerns, they were voiced, I think, by Stuart Graham in his evidence last week uh, about uh, potential risks involved, and I won't dwell on that, but I think they have to be taken into account. But nonetheless, we have been leading, and we shall continue to lead on this. Uh, uh, if further action is required, then, of course, it will be taken. Uh, but I should, uh, I, I hope, the committee will recognise that progress is being made, uh, and that's something that the Fish Health Framework uh, will take forward. Actually, just before, uh, if, you, if, if Mike wants to add to that, uh, I think it, it would be fair to say I did hold up a, a sheet of paper which, which showed the lice and the disease levels of a farm. And you can do that on any website, on the website for any farm in Norway. And it's two weeks behind. Given that most of the companies that operate in Scotland also operate in Norway, and given that one of the companies that operates in Scotland operates that particular website in uh, that inputs the data to that farm in Norway, which is so readily available. Is there any reason why it couldn't be transposed here in an accurate way, in the same way that they are in Norway? I don't understand why they're finding it so difficult to do the Scotland figures when they do it so well in Norway, Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I think the industry indicated it wanted to do more, uh, and we wish them to do more. We've made that absolutely clear. Uh, I mean, there are a large number of practical issues here, I think the evidence you heard last week in response, and I think it was Ben Hadfield said this, that in some ways Norway is ahead in regulations, but he then added that in some ways Scotland is ahead in regulations. I think we should remember that and don't uh, always be taking a, a sort of gloomy view about the regulatory framework in Scotland, which has had a lot of praise. But in this respect, you're right, there's more to be done, and the particular reasons behind that and the processes will be ones that will be considered in the fish health framework going forward. I think Mr. Mitchell may have some more information to provide. May, because I'd like to move on to the next question from Colin. Of course. Um, I think it's worth po pointing out that there's been a very significant government investment in Norway to uh, deliver on that particular website, um, and it's a relatively recent website development that you were able to, to, to tap into. Um, it is very much the case that we would want to get into that space over time. Um, but that may cost uh, money um, and currently the SSPO coordinates all of the data and that's part of the issue that we need to work through. Thank you, Alistair. Colin, uh, the next question is yours. Thanks, Convener. Can, can I turn specifically to the issue of, of, of sea lice um, trigger levels? The, the, the industry code of conduct, uh, sorry, code of good practice suggests a trigger level of between 0 0.5 and 1 adult female lice per fish, but Marine Scotland's trigger level is for farms to only report sea lice to Marine, to Marine Scotland at a level of three lice, and Marine Scotland only intervene at a level of, of eight lice. That's obviously a lot higher than the, the code of good practice, and it's a lot higher than, for example, um, the level set in Norway. So why is the trigger level by Marine Scotland so high, and what is the <coughs> impact of having a higher um, level when it comes to the, that, that, that trigger? Scotland has never set trigger levels for sea lice, but instead the reporting and intervention levels and its compliance policy are used by the Fish Health Inspectorate, who, whose uh, head I think probably would be best placed to answer this question if that's in order, Convener. If I may, I will, I will give you a very brief uh, and rapid canter through um, the Agricultural Fisheries Scotland Act. Um, when it was introduced in 2007, um, it gave the inspectorate powers to inspect and it allowed us to look at measures in place to control, prevent and reduce sea lice and it gave us um, powers to look at the number of sea lice and that is the limit of the regulatory uh, regime for sea lice in Scotland. Um, coming forward a decade, we reviewed the policy uh, in place which we considered with regard to satisfactory measures to control sea lice. In 2007, if you had access to all of the veterinary medicines, you were deemed to be compliant. You had satisfactory measures in place. We have reviewed that policy uh, more with regard to how those measures um, can be demonstrated to be satisfactory. So actually seeing numbers increasing or decreasing. Under the previous regime, 
you could have a very sea high sea lice number, uh, but still be compliant. Now we have um, required farmers to demonstrate that they can actually positively uh, treat the sea lice numbers by reducing the number to an acceptable level. Um, something that you, you would wish to be aware of is that the Code of Good Practice and the regulatory regime seek to do something slightly different. So the, the numbers in place are different. If we look at the first decade of the um, delivery of the legislation, uh, no warning letters, no enforcement notice were, notices were served. In 2017, we changed, changed the policy and came to a demonstration of satisfactory levels. Where satisfactory levels couldn't be uh, demonstrated, we have since served a number of warning letters and enforcement notices. I hope that is a brief. Come on, it doesn't really answer why you set the trigger level at the level it's set. It seems pretty arbitrary to me. And it is different. So why is that level set at the level of, of three lice and, and intervention at eight lice? What's the basis for that, that level? Because it is obviously different from other regimes. The point at which we were considering the change in policy, and you have to bear in mind that it predated the introduction of the policy, uh, we considered the average and peak numbers of lice on farms in Scotland. And those that were not, there was an analysis carried out by Murray and Hall, which I believe a copy has been submitted, um, and they were the average numbers um, which were available at the time. We are seeking to review the policy in July, and it is most likely that those numbers will change significantly. Okay. And can I ask, that based on those, those numbers that you currently use, how many times Marine Scotland have required a farm to take action based on those, those current trigger levels? The industry are very good at proactively managing their lice numbers. I have only served one enforcement notice in the last 10 months. Okay. Uh, and one of the, the, the pieces of evidence that the committee received um, was to suggest that, that because SEPA effectively decide how many fish are allowed in a cage, um, that it, it's reasonable to say that they are, in effect, over sea and sea lice by default. Do you think that's a, a, a fair point? I think I would correct you in your terminology. SEPA don't decide the number of fish which are available in a cage. They would they set a maximum biomass, which is acceptable set, yeah, to yeah, be yeah. on site. But do you think, do you think that's, um, do you think that I'm, I'm quoting the evidence given um, to the committee last week by, by John Gibb, um, but yeah, SEPA effectively decide on the biomass at a site, so the accusation is that they, by default, are effectively um, uh, setting set the level of, of, of sea lice. I don't think I would agree with that. I agree with that. Okay. 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 Colin, Okay, the next uh, series of questions uh, from John. John. Yes, I, th I think following on from that, uh, the, I mean, I think if, if I got you correctly, Cabinet Secretary used a phrase which was something like divergent and inconsistent science, i.e. we're getting very different views from different sectors. And that's been very much the case in the whole question of disease and or lice being transmitted between farmed and wild fish. On the one hand, we've had people saying... Uh, Clearly, it, things have got a lot worse and the fish have all vanished from the rivers because the, sea farm, the fish farms are there. And other people have said, well, since the 1950s, the number of salmon has been declining in the rivers, so it's got nothing to do with the farms. So we're getting very opposite views on this issue. Do you have a... Have you made a decision on that? Have you got a view on that? Whatever. Um, well, the number of things... I mean, it, the, the, these are inherently difficult areas for science. I mean, on a very basic level, let us remind ourselves that what is happening is happening under the surface of the sea. Uh, and therefore, it is by its nature not a straightforward thing to obtain evidence, uh, visual evidence as one can do where farming, for example, occurs on land. It's inherently difficult. And therefore, um, the task of marine scientists is by its nature not a straightforward one. When I refer to inconsistent evidence, I had in mind particularly the evidence in relation to the question of whether and what impact there is between farm salmon and wild salmon. 
And that's precisely why, convener, as I said in my opening remarks, that um, the Cabinet Secretary for the Environment and myself both agree that this must be looked at by um, a working group uh, of experts, and we are in the course of setting and finalising the setting that up at the moment. And they will be tasked at looking at all the evidence, but not punting it out forever, but doing so quickly and speedily, and to review the, uh, the evidence uh, and um, a, to a, consider all the literature and other evidence concerning the environmental impacts of salmon farms on wild salmon and aquaculture interventions. You know, I'm, I've looked at this myself, obviously, with advice, and, and I think uh, a, it is acknowledged that there are many, many factors which, uh, which influence the health of wild salmon. I think I've seen 12 referred to. I won't go through them, although I have in mind several of them. And therefore, it's an inherently complex business. Uh, but it's right that we get the best evidence, uh, and that evidential approach and that report, the report that we get from the interactions group um, between farmed and wild salmon is, I think, the sensible way forward to look at this. So that process was in train uh, some time ago, and we are just about to set up the group. And I certainly want, and I know Rosanna Cunningham agrees with me, that this work will be completed as quickly as possible, precisely because of the, the um, di divergence in some of the, the evidence that we have, and the lack of evidence, actually, about precise situation in Scotland, not least because in the West Coast there's, some say there's insufficient salmon numbers in order to for, for, form reliable samples in providing a, that evidence base. But in the meantime, I mean, decisions are having to be made about whether farms grow, relocate, all of these kind of things, a, based on in, incomplete evidence, and maybe it will always be incomplete. A, is, is it SEPA that we look to to really look after that part of the, the planning process and the ongoing regulation process, or is it one of the other regulators? Well, I think, think? The, the, the regulatory framework, the regulators, including SEPA and the planners, all have a role to play here, as, as does the industry. I mean, you heard Mr. Hadfield last week uh, saying that particular regard has, had to be, has to be had at the time of the season uh, when wild smolts go to sea from the Salmon Rivers. and the, so. You know, that's just one practical point that I would bring to bear. Um, so the industry have a role to play, uh, so do SEPA and so do the planners. And in relation to, you know, the siting of future, uh, future farms, plainly these, these issues uh, have to be considered on the basis of the, the uh, uh, best evidence. Uh, and uh, I think you did hear also an evidence from the industry, a move away from the siting or location of fish farms in sea lochs, if you like, uh, where uh, wild salmon is particularly important, out further, further out to, to sea. For example, the uh, ones around the Isle of Rum, which I think the <coughs> harvest are looking. So there's a whole range of, of responses, that uh, evidence-based responses, convener, that are taking place at the moment. But there is more work to be done, and we're determined to do it as quickly as possible following the Eclair report and the work of this committee. Yes, I mean, you're right, Cabinet Secretary, that we did hear the idea of uh, farms being moved further out, although I think the industry also said there's quite a health and safety issue there for, for their staff, yeah. and they would have a duty on that area. The, the kind of final point then, I mean, we, we visited Loch Aber, some of us, the other week, and I think it was very positive. I found it very helpful, and we met both people representing the wild fisheries and the, the salmon farms, and they seemed to be talking to each other. I don't think the relationship was perfect, but it seemed to be quite healthy. I don't think that's the case all around Scotland. Do you, do you, has the government got any role, or is there anything we can do to try and bring people together and get them to talk to each other? Because the example you gave about certain times a year you leave the, the farms fallow seems like a good one. Uh, well, yes, I think in, in Loch Aber, you know, there's some positive news about uh, salmon levels in, for, for example, the River Lochie. Uh, also, I think the River Carron was referred to. Uh, so... There's a different picture, on, uh, as I understand it, and I'm no expert. Um, but to answer your question, I think, yes, it's it, very sensible to uh, try to bring the wild salmon and the farm salmon sector together. It might be a bit of a challenge, but I think it would be extremely desirable. Maybe the committee might consider in its report how that could be done, uh, whether it could be done. I think there's a cultural issue here of working together, all of us, to support marine activity, which seems to exist in Norway, but perhaps not quite so evident in, in Scotland. 
and uh, perhaps an, a sense that the conflict between various groups is, is really too tense and not really proportionate to the discussions which we should be having in which everybody should be seeking to coexist and finding and adopting uh, best practice. Um, and I would like just to stress in that regard, convener, that the interactions group that I've referred to will have wild fish interests on it and represented. You know, so we want all the relevant voices around the table, not only those of the farm sector. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Graham Day, I'd like to bring you in at this stage, if I may. Uh, thank you, Kavino. Just, just a small point. In terms of developing our knowledge base, Cabinet Secretary, do you accept that we perhaps need to better understand uh, the migratory routes of wild fish? And when we get, if and when we get to that point, use that as a basis for planning where fish farms should go, i.e. keep them well away from those routes. It strikes me that's a, perhaps a common sense approach. Um, I, I think it's, it's certainly a common sense approach and it's an easy to enunciate in principle. Um, and uh, I think the interactions group will look at that. I don't know if, uh, if uh, the, in fact, they will, they will be looking at that issue to see what more can be done about that. Um, just to uh, ask a quick question, um, and, and also to concur with the views of John Mason about Loch Abba, which I know from personal experience, there is a very a good relationship, or at least a, a relationship, between the wild fishery um, sector and, and, the, and the fish farming sector. But my point is a bit more general than that. Um, the Eclair Committee noted that a lot of focus is often on um, fish farming at sea, um, and that freshwater fish farming perhaps gets um, slightly ignored. Um, can the um, Cabinet Secretary reassure, reassure me that um, freshwater fish farming is, is, on, is on his radar, as it were, and the environmental impacts of freshwater fish farming um, are being considered? True. Yes, I can, and yes, we've, we've uh, had meetings and attention given to that. I think maybe would Char Charles be, you have more information on this, Charles? Fresh, freshwater um, salmon aquaculture is the issues, the, the sort of high level issues, are treated in a very, very similar way to uh, salmon farming in the, in the marine environment. So development would still be um, considerate of the environment, the requirements for environmental impact assessments. Um, the discharges from which are still regulated by SEPA, the disease issues are still regulated by ourselves, um, and the natural heritage um, impacts or potential impacts uh, are considered by SNH at the, at the planning stage. Okay. Um, okay, we'll move on to the next question. Uh, Richard, that's you. Um, one of the concerns of the Clear Committee was the volume of waste discharged from fish farms. Uh, the industry wishes to double production, but with that aim, there may be more waste, Cabinet Secretary. CEPA has now issued this committee with an updated policy response further to the attendance at the committee on 18th April, and I'll read part of it. Changes we will be making to the way we regulate emissions of organic waste will a. deliver a step change in the scientific monitoring and modelling of our organic waste releases into the marine environment, b help fish farm businesses locate their operations where the sea has a necessary environment capacity to accommodate the scale of production they're planning and expose parts of the coast with strong tides can quickly dilute and disperse organic waste. Do you agree with CEPA's policy statement and should some, as you're saying, uh, and, and I would support, uh, and should some farming uh, uh, organisations now consider relocation to doubling their output. To that, Cabinet Secretary, I should actually point out that this evidence was uh, delivered to the committee late last night. Um, so those people that have waded through, I think it's the 162 responses which are still rising, uh, which I will claim to have done uh, formally today. Um, I haven't had a chance to consider this, and not all of the committee have chance to ha had a chance to consider it. So, Cabinet Secretary, you, you may well not have seen it unless well, they gave you advance. I commend on. Mr Lyle on his diligence. Uh, uh, and I, I was being diligent, but in other ways, <laughs> uh, both last night and uh, from quite early this morning. And I became aware at quarter to ten that SEPA had issued this extra information 
by which time it was rather late in the day to read through it. But I mean, plainly, these, these are important matters and we respect the work that SEPA does as a, as a regulator. The issue of waste was rightly highlighted by Claire. I, I think there, there was a, a very useful piece of evidence, which I did read last night from uh, Mr. Hadfield to the convener of Eclair on the 27th of April, in which he, I think he did seek to correct some information given by the National Trust for Scotland about some of the problems relating to that. But that doesn't detract from the fact that these are important issues. And there's a great deal of work. I mean, I, I, I'm not quite sure which official can talk about the detail, because I did read this last night, convener. But the, there's a lot of different types of work done uh, to, to test waste, to control, uh, to prevent waste from occurring in the first place, to deal with the, the deposition and the location of farms, to consider the fallow periods. Industry themselves are using more fallow periods in many occasions to allow the seabed to recover. There's the question of what the content is. And, I'd like, I think, to dispel in particular the idea that there's sort of fecal coliforms deposited. That's completely wrong and unfortunate that one witness gave that evidence to Eclair, but fortunately Mr. Hadfield has dispelled that with his letter. So there's a whole range of uh, technical uh, um, work which is done by SEPA, and I think it's right to acknowledge that because there's a real risk that committees which have inevitably a short space of time within which to research highly complex matters can be taken off track by, by one or two uh, uh, misguided witnesses. I think Mr. Mitchell may have some further technical information, convener, if the committee wishes it. Very briefly, just to add that uh, Marine Scotland and Scottish Government funded uh, significant improvements to the modelling capability of SEPA through something called Depot Mode, which allows them now to uh, take uh, judgment calls on, on improved data flow uh, and, and modelling work as far as the impact of new developments are concerned. Um, so it's, again, a bit of a journey, um, but we are improving the database and our understanding of what the impacts might be. Uh, and, and that's certainly something that the SEPA um, are taking forward with the sector. Um, you know, can I, I'll quickly ask my, my next couple of questions. Given the polluter pays principle, should fish farms who use the environment to simulate their waste pay for the ecosystem? And should, as I believe, the salmon, and I don't think this question has been asked yet, should the salmon industry come under the remit of one agency instead of dealing with several agencies for planning permission, licensing, and different other things that they have to do? Should we not uh, insist or, or not ensure that we have one agency dealing with the salmon industry and the wild salmon, uh, both wild and farm salmon industry. Before we answer that question, Mr. Lyle, you, you have just uh, asked a question that uh, Mr. Rumbles was going to ask later. Sorry, so that. I'm going to suspend the question on regulatory framework uh, because that comes later. Um, so I, I'm sorry. Uh, at this stage, if you are ready to answer it, you'll get a chance to answer it later. Could you go back to the original question that Mr. Lyle answered, that given the polluter pays principle, Cabinet Secretary? Well, plainly, industry are responsible for their actions on a general level, but I mean, the whole point of the regulatory framework is to uh, the code of practice, the whole point of the overall um, thorough nature of the environmental assessment. Uh, uh, and the technical rules about operating and managing fish farms is to prevent um, a serious issues arising in the first place. I mean, in terms of technical legal arguments, I think I would like to, you know, to, to say that we would need to, to look at specific instances, but in general, of course, the industry are responsible for, um, for their activities. I don't know if any official can add anything more specific to that, Alistair. Only to add that I think Anne Anderson and her evidence did acknowledge that the SEPA charges were proportionate to the, the, the work at hand um, with any particular farm or uh, organisation company. So there, it, it, there is an inherent polluter pays, if you will, within that context. The, the natural lead on to that is, Kate, with your next question. A brief question on closed containment, land-based closed containment. What is the panel's view on how that might, A, mitigate the, the number of environmental concerns 
and B, obviously there are challenges to um, the, in terms of the capital and the innovation. What kind of support could government offer to the industry in terms of taking forward innovation? Um, yes, well, the, the kind of recirculating aquaculture systems or closed containment um, in the production of smalts have been in use for the last decade in, in Scotland, last decade or so. Um, there's one site opening at Inchmore near Inverness and another in the construction phase at Oban, so this is very much a, a current uh, a development. Um, I think it's important to say that one shouldn't assume that, that this type of fish farming, it's a different type, uh, is free from the, from the challenges that are faced by um, sea-based farming. That's, I believe, not the case. They don't necessarily mitigate the effects of, of disease, and no doubt officials could expand on that. But nonetheless, they do offer an attractive solution in addressing a number of concerns in relation to impacts on the marine environment, for example, potential impacts on, on wild salmon. Um, uh, there are some concerns about this technology, which I can share more detail in writing if the committee wishes, but it's seen, I think, as a positive development in all. It's, lastly, uh, you know, I know that HIE are, of course, um, very experienced in their um, support of the aquaculture sector, and very supportive, um, and also SEIC has um, facilitated uh, and helps with work in relation to innovation and research as is correct. Um, so, uh, you know, there is, I think, support available for taking forward this, uh, this different type of, of fish farming, and I think that's, that support is justified, but we, we have to not suspend our critical faculties in taking it forward. Um, I'm going to bring in Graham at this stage, and Kate, I'll come back to you if you, if you, if you think there's a follow-up. Graham, and I know, Alistair, you want to answer, so I'll be looking for you there. I, I appreciate that, Camino. Can I just pick up on, on something you said earlier, Cabinet Secretary, you, said, you kind of indicated a view that perhaps some of the evidence that the Environment Committee received was inaccurate, and, and that can happen in a, an evidence-gathering uh, process. So, but can I just explore another aspect of evidence that was taken in relation to Coast containment, because it was suggested to the Environment Committee, if I remember correctly, um, that if it was moved, if fish farming was moved on shore, fish farms would require sewage treatment uh, plants accompanying these almost on a one-to-one -one basis, which at face value would perhaps support the concerns that are out there about the amount of waste that's going into the marine environment. I just wonder if you could kind of respond to that, whether you, you accept that's accurate or not. Cabinet uh, Secretary, do you want to come in? Um, or well, you know, it's, it's a relatively, um, a, it's, it's not such a, a prevalent activity as sea, sea farm, farm salmon, so I don't have a specific answer to that question. I don't know if officials can, but we could certainly get back to the member. I mean, I have lots of information here about potential areas of which need to be looked at, but they don't really answer Mr. Day's question. I don't know if any uh, other if, if officials can add anything or we could write to you, uh, Mr. Day, and yourself, convener, with that information, if that's in order. Yeah, I think all I wish to observe is that, that this is very, very cutting-edge technology. So it's still being trialled and prototyped mainly in, in Norway. Um, so I think it's quite speculative at the moment in terms of the assessments of what kind of infrastructure would need to be put around uh, closed containment um, functions and, and, and plants. Um, I think there is a general consensus that the energy use is relatively high um, uh, and they are hungry for energy, these, um, these installations. And I, I think in, in terms of, therefore, the impact on, uh, on, on energy, that's, that's quite a serious consideration uh, to be had. But I think further work still needed and when we talk to the sector, they are very, very interested in these developments. Um, but they are all clearly of a view that we're not quite yet at the stage where it can be rolled out um, at a kind of industrial scale. It's still in the prototype phase. Um, uh, so we're still learning, um, I think is the, the short answer. Cabinet Secretary, I, I think the committee would, would, would uh, like to take you up on the offer to, to receive a written submission uh, on this because there are evidence uh, within the submissions that we've received 
uh, to the committee's inquiry relating to closed containment and therefore uh, further information I'm sure would be extremely helpful. And I'd also say that the committee when we went over to uh, the West Coast saw a closed containment uh, 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 hatchery um, production facility for smolts um, which was extremely interesting so I'm sure that more information would be much appreciated. Uh, Gail Ross, the next question. Thank you, Convener. <clears throat> we've, uh, we've heard that the US are bringing in regulations by 2022 that if we keep shooting seals, we will potentially uh, lose access to a very lucrative market that in 2017 was worth £193 million. We have heard that the number of seals being shot is decreasing, but it was still uh, 49 in 2017. What are the Scottish Government doing to ensure that that number goes down to zero? And are you concerned that we may not get there by 2022? Uh, well, there's two parts to the question. I mean, plainly, seal predation has long been recognised as a problem for fish farms. Uh, uh, and as uh, Gil Ross says, I'm very pleased that the, the, uh, uh, the industry are, are, are now uh, managing matters in such a way as the a number of licenses and number of, uh, of controls are reducing. I think it is relevant to say that this is an area where technology can play and is playing a part in using sonar devices to scare off seals. The use of technology is an exciting area of aquaculture which offers opportunities uh, for economy, but also actually to, uh, to do things which everyone would agree would be terrific, namely to to eradicate the, the need to uh, control any seals at all. The second part of the question relates to the um, impending um, deadline imposed by the USA in terms of this matter. And I can say that, you know, obviously my officials are uh, looking at this very carefully to understand exactly what these requirements in fact mean and to make sure that, uh, they, that we understand them first uh, and uh, then consider how we deal with them. And obviously, these are matters upon which there will be parliamentary traffic and, and under which I, on which I agree to report back to members when we have substantive, substantive progress. I don't know if there's anything more specific we can say about that. But well, we can confirm that we're in proactive discussions um, with DEFRA, with the EU, and indeed um, we intend to be speaking to the US authorities um, uh, this summer um, in the margins of the NASCO conference um, in, in Maine in the US um, uh, in order to better understand exactly the extent of the regulation, um, how it might um, affect Scotland. There's, there's, there's been quite a process of um, uh, uh, securing absolute clarity on exactly how it will impact um, uh, and clearly uh, planning for that um, and uh, ensuring that Scotland is ready uh, for whatever the impact of the regulation will be. We're, we're also conscious that we're not alone in this. Uh, uh, other aquaculture nations that produce Atlantic salmon have similar concerns, Norway, Canada, Chile. Uh, so we are in dialogue with them too, so that we are all comfortable with what the US regulations mean. Um, Cabinet Secretary, you mentioned the use of um, acoustic deterrent devices. How are these currently regulated in Scotland? Well, they have been used for, for many years to deter seals from attacking fish farm cages, which is, is a good thing. And that has, I think, played a part in seeing a reduction in the number of seals having to be controlled. And for example, there's been a reduction of 80% in the seals controlled under licence since the licensing was actually introduced in 2000. And, 11, and the research suggests that, that some ADDs might result in significant disturbance for particular cetacean species. So in terms of regulation, Marine Scotland Science have been asked to review this science with a view to providing um, advice to inform future policy on their use. Thank you. Uh, John, the next question is yours. Hey, thanks very much, Convener, and it's moving on to the subject of accreditation. Now, we did a video conference with the Agriculture Stewardship Council, and they told us that one, I think one, farm was accredited in Scotland. We've since learned that they've got issues with fresh water farming, and, and certainly Marine Harvest told us they were going to try and work through that. 
Since then, I mean, I'm aware of SSPO Code of Good Practice, Label Rouge, um, the Global Aquaculture Alliance Best Aquacultural Practices, the Global Gap, RSPCA, I believe some of the supermarkets do their own accreditation. I have to say, I find this somewhat confusing picture, and if I went out to the shop and bought a bit of salmon, I wouldn't know where to start. D does the government have a view on accreditation and where we should be going with this? Um, well, I, I did hear previous evidence that suggested that it is uh, somewhat complex and uh, also costly. And I think uh, one of the companies last week did mention a figure a not in, in considerable amount of money that they invest in this, and rightly so, because we want to have uh, the accreditation to ensure consumer protection and continuing, continuing confidence in consumers. I think Mr. Palmer can provide a little bit more information, though. Well, uh, as I think you heard last week from the sector, there, there are many different forms of accreditation, and um, uh, the companies in Scotland um, signed up to a number of them. It's not something which um, the government um, has taken a role in. Um, this is very much... Uh, uh, a feature of the commercial relationship often between uh, a producing company and the retailers. Um, uh, and it's clearly something that we as a government would be support, are, are supportive of in terms of encouraging um, our companies always to go beyond the, the bare statutory minimum, if you like, um, and, 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 and to enhance that through different certification schemes, which is often what the the retailers require of the producing companies. I know that you weren't able to um, uh, attract any retailers to come and give evidence to you, but I think, I think you would need to speak to them about their particular logic. The one thing that we um, are, do find interesting about the Aquaculture Stewardship Council certification is that it, it does appear to have a remit that, that, that goes into the interactions with wild fish and wild salmon, and that's quite an interesting aspect of that particular scheme. Um, uh, that, that, that seems to distinguish it from some of the other schemes. Um, uh, so, so that is something that we talk to the sector about and uh, uh, explore with the sector where they wish to go with those kinds of schemes, but, but we wouldn't prescribe to them on that. I, I think, just to add very briefly, if I might, the one thing that we are involved with is the Code of Good Practice, which the industry uh, members sign up to, and at its heart, many of the same requirements are in that code. I think um, something in the order of 500 different points um, within that code which are independently audited form the base of many of those other accreditations. Charles may want to add to that. I mean, I, I think I would very briefly answer your question with how, how do you choose your salmon? You choose Scotland first. Uh, independently, it has been verified as the tastiest salmon. Uh, however, with, with regard to your question over accreditation schemes, um, what they seek to do is actually provide a differentiation in the market so that my salmon is different to your salmon because I'm accredited under the scheme, you're accredited under that scheme. Um, the, there, are, there are powers within... Um, the legislation, if we see fit, uh, to adopt part of or all of an accreditation scheme. And in, indeed, Mike, you refer to the number of uh, times that accreditation visits take place. Some of, some of the farmers are basically, they have an entire department, um, and every day there is somebody looking at an aspect um, of, of their accreditation, whether that is a regulator, a supermarket, um, or a scheme uh, provider. Supplementary convener. I mean, you know, as, as a kind of consumer, uh, I think it, I still think it's confusing. And if I, see, I absolutely, I buy Scottish salmon first choice, uh, but there can be two or three different kinds within a supermarket. And, you know, I get confused. And if I get confused, I'm assuming that other people would as well. I mean, in an ideal world, if there was one stamp and you could, you know, go with that but I suppose given that it's world, some of these things are worldwide do we just have to accept that it's a complex picture when there's not going to be one accreditation system and from what I'm understanding the government is not saying that one is best Cabinet Secretary, like you would like to answer that well I, I think that the different uh, uh, measures that Mr Mason's described are not all seeking to achieve the same function um, uh, uh, but I, I do think think that Mr. Mason's got a point, but it's probably primarily for industry to, to, to look at. I mean, 
we uh, are very proud of the fact that Scottish salmon has the La Belle Rouge distinction in France. And also, that, as you heard last week, uh, you know, the world's experts, uh, consumers, gathered at Brussels at the Seafood Expo, which I attended recently, voted Scottish salmon the tastiest by 7 out of 14, and that was three years running. So, you know, um, we, we should be recognising and maybe recognising that our industry is doing something pretty well, given it gets that these accolades and it has a commercial premium of 10% or 50 to 60p a kilo. I mean, these are all very, very good things. And my personal view is that we need to demonstrate its continuing sustainability in order to remain the top, number one, the best. And uh, that's why it's so important that this work that we are determined to do with regulators, industry, scientists and, and NGOs working together uh, to tackle these challenges must, must uh, be done with absolute determination and necessary resource. And that's what we're, we're doing and what we will continue to do. Okay, thanks so much. And that neatly leads on to the next question from John Finney. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, we've had a lot of representations about oversight, and indeed that's been touched on today with a number of people commending, for instance, the, the Norway model. There's been a range of views presented to the committee. We've heard from James Withers, Scottish Food and Drink, that a more strategic framework and overview of how the industry works would be useful. Uh, this term has been alluded to already, I think, in our discussions today, the Agriculture Industry Leadership Group. Um, and um, we, in written evidence, we hear from FMS that, um, what, although we discussed this, the, and they say that the Agriculture Industry Leadership Group was discussed on 25th April, what was not qualified was that AILG has effectively uh, replaced the Ministerial Group for Sustainable Aquaculture, thereby leaving a significant gap in addressing interactions between farmed and wide, wide uh, and wild fish and the wider environment. So I don't know if you'd wish to comment on that spe specific point. And also, we have a, a quote here from um, Fish Update, which I have to acknowledge I'd never encountered before reading these papers. And it outlines the comment attributed to you at the Fish Expo, quote, I'm determined to give what leadership I can to make sure no matter what challenges are thrown at it, you double growth, let's do it, let's go Scotland. Um, so what leadership do you give to the salmon industry, Cabinet Secretary? I did at the beginning, with the, in the speech I made in Brussels, I said, as I said today, that we have to tackle these uh, challenges to, to be successful. I'd make, uh, I've said that in every opportunity and I repeat that. Uh, and only if we can do that can we go on to see the growth that I hope uh, Mr Finney would like uh, to see. I mean, after all, uh, you know, Marine Harvest, I think, say that, that uh, every day there's uh, six or seven million people have a meal of salmon. There's 7,000 million people in the world. Many, many people in the world in poorer countries don't have the opportunity that we do, the luxury that we have to enjoy this nutritious food, which incidentally, Mr Finney, is the is the most effective in terms of the environment with the lowest carbon footprint. As far as the ILG is concerned, um, you've heard from many witnesses that a Team Scotland approach, I think, is essential here to bring people together so that we don't see silo working. In terms of its uh, place as it sits in the oversight uh, role, um, I think you've, you've heard that we have specific groups doing specific tasks. Mr Hadfield and the Chief Scientist of Marine Scotland Chair 1 on Fish Health. We are setting up one on the impacts or possible impacts between farm salmon and wild salmon. So we are, I think, giving the right attention to environmental issues uh, as, as a, a government. However, I think you know, the purpose of these committees is in part an attempt for us to reassess how we're doing. And we are open to, uh, uh, to any positive, constructive suggestions, policy suggestions about what more uh, we can do. And indeed, I think we've already said in several respects that we are um, doing more. I mean, we've heard about the review in July about sea lice regulation and the numbers, which uh, Mr. Smith asked about. The consenting review uh, is taking place as well. So this is a most dynamic sector. Change is happening rapidly. We have to respond rapidly. And I'm determined that there shall be sustainable growth and the sustainable part of that, that epithet is essential. Not that it should matter, but like Mr Mason, I'm a regular consumer of Scottish salmon and, and I, I do value that product, but it doesn't take away any of the questions we legitimately have to, to look at behind this. I wonder, can you comment on that suggestion of a gap, um, Cabinet Secretary, that um, the leadership group replacing the ministerial group for sustainable uh, aquaculture left a, a significant quote, 
leaving a significant gap in addressing interactions between farmed and wild fish and the wider environment. Um, well, I don't th think it's apposite because, as I say, we, we are setting up a group to look at that, mindful of Mr Mason's point earlier on, that the science in this area is not by any means clear-cut. And therefore, I think it's appropriate, rather than there being a ministerial group that's looking at issues where the key determinants are complex evidence. I think in this case, convener, my feeling, although I'm happy to, you know, if, if the committee come up with a different view, of course we will consider that, but my view is that, you know, there are roles for ministers in terms of general oversight and policy, but ministers probably aren't the best people to chair highly technical groups where the requirement is to compile a literature review, to analyze it in detail, I mean, the reason Mr. Hadfield is co-chairing a group is that, as well as leading industry, he's a marine scientist. Um, you know, that's, it's horses for courses, convener, and I, I hope and I want to assure Mr. Finney that we have uh, the right approach, which is an inclusive, open approach, uh, but using the right people to consider the, the right um, topic, topics for analysis. And so much of this is based on science that, plainly, a, rightly, scientists are co-chairing or chairing or being involved in the, the various groups that we have at the moment, considering important environmental matters. Okay, but can I bring in Peter and then yes. maybe come back to you, because Peter, I think you've got a supplement. Well, Howard, it's about, it's about government, government leadership and what the government can do to, to help this industry to grow and, and where it should, should grow. I mean, I think we all agree that there are some salmon farms that are in the wrong place, knowing what we know now. And to be fair, some salmon farms have, have, have actually shut down where they're in the wrong place because they're in mouths of salmon rivers or whatever. So the, what I'm looking for is a strategic overview from government as to where you know, we see as being the, the correct place to expand this industry and maybe wh where it isn't the correct place to expand. And there has been some work done, and I have a map here which shows work that was done, and this is, this is from 2013. And, you know, the different colours show whether it's a good place to expand or not such a good place to expand. That's what was done in 2013, as I say, funded by the government, but done by a, a, the Rivers and Fisheries Trust Scotland, rafts. Um, but unfortunately, it appears that the funding for, for this work has, has now ceased, and there's nothing further to update this from, from as I say, the, the data that was pr produced in 2013. I believe, you know, a strategic overview from government as to where we would like to see more expansion in other areas where it is, it is it not so uh, satisfactory. Something like the, the traffic light system that they have in Norway, the red, green, you know, if you're in a green area, you can go ahead and expand. If you're in a red area, there's no way you can expand further in that area. So a strategic overview of where we would like to see expansion in other areas where maybe we should draw back. Why isn't the government continuing that work? Because it, obviously some was done, but nothing's happened since 2013. Um, well, I, I did it. I was thinking Mr Chapman started off well, and I did agree with much of what he said at the beginning. I mean, for example, that, you know, some salmon farm locations have been moved uh, precisely for the reasons that Mr Chapman mentioned. Uh, and a lot of work has been done on this. I think where I would respectfully disagree is to suggest that that work came to an abrupt halt. That's not the case, and I think Mr Mitchell is about to explain why. So I, th I think the map that you've, you've shown is from a project called MyApp, which was done at that time and it completed its, uh, its work. And that, that was the outcome and the output indeed. Um, within Marine uh, Science, um, within M Marine Scotland, we have been working on heat maps, which essentially take that work to another level. Now it is highly complex um, and it gives a relative value to particular locations and the opportunity that exists for growth in that particular area based on um, a whole range of criteria, including the number of farms that are already there, but, but, but many others. Um, and just to touch on this, maybe in a slightly broader sense, um, we definitely do see an opportunity through innovation. And uh, I think that map would evidence the fact that higher energy locations further out give you more opportunity in that respect. I think Ben Hadfield talked about the fact that marine harvest have been consolidating their sites um, into, into um, bigger sites, but more efficient ones in higher energy locations. I think that's something that we would look to support 
support. Um, but that takes innovation in technology in terms of the equipment and so on, and indeed larger smolts. And we touched on recirculation hatcheries earlier. Um, Ideally, using bigger smolts in those kind of locations reduces the time in the open sea, which reduces the interaction with wild fish, which I think is crucial, reduces the sea lice burden, uh, and indeed reduces the disease risk. So there's a kind of virtuous circle that can be introduced, and that's the kind of territory we want to get into strategically. Well, I'm about the work still going. So, I mean, can we, can we look forward to a new map, you know, updated, an updated map along the lines that we've seen here? And, I, you know, I think this, this sort of work would certainly help the planning process and help the planners to, to you know, to, to, to really direct the, the expansion to the, to the correct areas. And that's what we all want to see. Yeah, yes, that's absolutely the, in, the intention, that that helps to inform planning um, around the country. Um, mm. And indeed will be part of the kind of consenting review that we look at uh, and, and, and how all of that fits together as a jigsaw. Do you want to come back in there? Uh, um, convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, a few of us from this committee, indeed the Eclair Committee, were fortunate enough to meet with the Norwegi Norwegian Fisheries Minister. Now, this is a global market and clearly Norway are a, a significant competitor. Has the Scottish Government made any assessment of their approach to um, the salmon industry and any lessons that could be learnt from there? Well, we, we do consider um, various aspects of the Norwegian um, in industry, it has uh, been a terrific success story operating at a much higher level of production and doing so sustainably. I mean, uh, it, it, it's not all one way. I mean, I think we heard, for example, from uh, one of the witnesses that uh, our um, regulatory framework in respect of the use of treatments was pioneering. Uh, uh, and uh, we've heard today that perhaps we've got more to learn from Norway in respect of sea lice reporting and transparency. Um, but yes, I think that we, we do uh, look at, uh, at uh, Norway quite a lot and uh, in terms of specific aspects. And of course, our scientists are working um, a, with their counterparts in Norway. Um, uh, and uh, also, there is a quadrilateral forum exists where officials meet and get together from the four big salmon farming nations. And I think Mr. Palmer alluded to that joint working in relation to the USA issue, for example, and he alluded to that earlier. So I think, you know, Mr. Finney raises an important point. I would love to have a trip to Norway, um, but, you know, I'm before this committee so often that I'm not quite sure when the opportunity will arise, but uh, I, when the diary permits, convener, um, you know, I hope to go to Norway and learn a lot. Um, and, and, and sorry, if I can just, uh, uh, but I think we should move on from that. I mean, I think that I, I've had to fend off requests from this committee to go to Norway. I'm not sure I'm in a position to, to do anything about your trips, Cabinet Secretary, to Norway. But I think we maybe just leave that one there because we've got a few questions to go. And I'd like to move to, to, to Gail Ross. Thank you, Convener. Um, SIPA have written to the Eclair Committee about their um, proposals for the changes to the depositional zone regulations. And um, Alistair, I think you touched on it slightly in your answer to Peter Chapman. Um, but essentially, the proposal allows fish farms to be bigger, uh, located away from sensitive areas and further away from the coast. So what do you see as the main advantages and disadvantages of these proposals? And how will these regulations affect Marine Scotland's ability to regulate the health and sea lice burden of these fish? In general terms, it's more advantage than disadvantage, which is why we support that kind of development and direction of travel. Um, you do need better uh, technology as far as the fish farms themselves are concerned. Also in terms of, of the fish that go in the pens, they have to be bigger and more, more robust. Um, there are health and safety challenges for the human operatives in higher energy locations that have to be taken into account. And I think that was mentioned by uh, uh, Ben Hadfield, I think, in, in his, his evidence session. But the advantages substantively are that you have a, a, a shorter time in the marine environment and a reduced interaction with wild fish. The shorter time in the marine environment grow out phase means in, in, in basic terms, 
less disease and less sea lice, and, and the holy grail is getting to a year or less in the marine environment because um, there, there's a kind of moment in time when a lot of these issues accelerate in the second year in the marine. So if we can move to something shorter, there are commensurate benefits which allow the kind of sustained uh, expansion that, that people have talked about. What, what would you say are the um, challenges currently to this move? Um, I don't know if Charles... Um, just seeing him indicate. Charles, I, 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 I think the biggest um, challenges are technological mm -hmm. uh, and engineering. It's a, it's, a, it's a big engineering challenge to take a structure and moor it in absolutely open, exposed water. Whilst the industry is moving to more, more exposed areas, they are not, not yet operating in full open water. You're looking at sort of um, oil industry style engineering. Uh, to retain integrity in, in, a, in a fully open environment. Could you make any educated guesses as to a time scale? I think actually, it's, it's kind of happening now in an incremental way. So uh, the Cabinet Secretary alluded to um, the small isles and, and the growth there, which is a higher energy location, albeit... Um, in, in the lee of, of some of the islands there. I think if you look at parts of Orkney where fish farming is expanding, I doubt very much that would have been possible 10 years ago. So I, I think it's a moving feast. Um, the Norwegians are taking that to a more of an open sea approach, but it's an incredibly early stage and they are spending inordinate amounts of money on research and development to take them there. Um, and I, I don't think we have the scale in Scotland to support the, the level of investment that, that they're talking about in very strictest R&D terms. It's hundreds of millions of pounds. Mm, that's interesting. Thanks. Thank you. And now, uh, Mike, on, on the subject which we saved uh, from earlier on. Thank you very much, convener, and good morning. Um, I think we'd all agree, would we not, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but wouldn't we all agree, that having an effective regulatory regime is essential uh, to having a successful and quality industry which we all want to see so on that basis can i ask you i mean to give you an example before i ask my ask my question we had one witness uh, a producer from shetland who said when he was setting up his fish farms there was a lot of regulation he had five different licenses to go through so there's effective regulation setting up the fish farm but we had another witness come to us and say well actually this industry is self-regulatory because once it's set up, once it's going, where's the regulation? And so, uh, really, do you accept that the complexity of the regulation, including gaps in regulation, um, you know, different regulators doing their own little, well, their own big job, um, is a concern? Could it be a constraint on the growth of the industry because we haven't got that comprehensive regulatory system which would be a success which everybody I think everybody wants to see well I think Mr Rommels makes uh, a lot of good points I don't think he inserted any words in my mouth so far as I can see but um, I think you make a number of points which I hope are relevant to to that I mean firstly we we do have a regulatory regime which is held in high regard internationally and has a high degree of statutory underpinning and if we didn't I don't think we would have got the label rouge and the accolades and the premium that I talked about earlier um, but we can't rest on our laurels, so uh, I'm keen to, uh, always keen to review and, re uh, and reduce regulatory burden wherever possible, where it is disproportionate and where it doesn't meet the principles of better regulation, as set out by a better regulation group, of which Mr Rumbles will be well aware. Um, there are a number of regulators, and I think Mr Graham gave evidence last week that, that, that it was the number two constraint issue after... Um, uh, the challenges that we've rightly focused on uh, uh, today. But equally, we want to make sure that in terms of transparency and in terms of sea lice control, that we have robust levels of regulation. Um, to move from the, the kind of four or five layered approach at the moment to, you know, uh, to a simpler regime is not a straightforward matter. It, it's, it's something which 
may be uh, uh, desirable in practice but somewhat difficult to achieve. I think the primary task at the moment is to focus resolutely uh, and forensically on tackling the particular challenges that are occupying rightly our time. But I'm also sympathetic to trying to have a consenting regime which gets the best, which gets sustainable agriculture and doesn't uh, you know, take uh, forever to navigate nor um, involve disproportionate expense and complexity. So, um, you know, so I, I think that's a very fair, uh, fair question, Mr. Rumbles, and we, cer we, we, we cer certainly are keen to see what emerges from the, this committee's inquiry and the Eclair inquiry in informing our future uh, uh, approach. But we have already indicated in several ways what more we're already doing or about to do, which, uh, uh, which ab abuts on the regulatory issue, I think. Well, when we had the regulators in, and, and I mean, I asked them, particularly SEPA in response to the Environment <coughs> Committee's quite stark criticism, of, particularly of SEPA in this whole, this whole process. And to be fair to SEPA, they, they, they said they were operating within the rules set down by them. I and mean, I don't think anybody's talking about setting up a new regulator to regulate the whole industry. But would it not be best to say give SEPA um, a a different, um, a different framework to work within? In other words, to give it a, a lead role in which it can perhaps coordinate the other regulators around it? So that, as I say, we're not talking about, I don't think we're talking about, and I don't want to preempt anybody on the committee, but I don't think we're talking about recommending a new, a new regulator, but we think there's a gap, there's a gap there which, which will be a constraint to the industry, and we want to see that uh, industry succeed in, in the I'm sympathetic to that yeah. but if you think about it you know the planning authorities are there to issue licenses and planning permissions SEPA is there to protect the environment they, they have different functions mm. um, so it's not an easy matter but I'm, I'm attracted I'm instinctively attracted towards uh, a simpler model if that's possible to be achieved but that's not the main priority for me it's tackling the challenges the other thing I would say is that in relation to the notion that somehow it's all voluntary at some point, I don't think that's quite correct. I mean, what I would, I was thinking about this uh, uh, in the light of having heard some of the previous evidence, it seems to me this, that, um, you know, regulations exist to make sure that, that, that fish farms are located in a suitable location, having regard to the main characteristics and the perceived impacts on the environment. In some cases, they're refused, of course, to protect the environments, and that's, uh, that's uh, rightly so. Uh, the SEPA regulations exist in order to monitor, uh, uh, to monitor good practice, to control good practice. Um, uh, but of course, the farms themselves have to manage their day-to-day -day activity themselves. In that respect, it's voluntary, but that doesn't mean the regulations don't apply. They do. Because, for example, if the levels of sea rice exceed a certain level, then they have to report them. And they also have to continuously observe and implement and obtemper regulations. So there's a duty to do specific things, like reporting, mm. and there's a duty to abide by good practice, which continually exists. So thinking about this, I, I, I don't think it's correct to say that there's you know, a huge swathe of, of uh, fish farm management that is completely unregulated. Mm. It is regulated, but we have to let, at some point, the managers get on with their job mm. on the basis that uh, you know, they have, as we do, uh, an interest in pursuing the highest standards of sustainability, and they have an economic interest in minimising problems as well. Okay, uh, Richard. Yeah, the, the question I was asking earlier, and it wasn't in regard to regulation, it was regard to and regulation. So the government regulates, local councils regulate, SEPA regulates, HIE regulates, Marine Scotland regulates, Crown Estates can regulate. So the point I was making earlier was, and we have not discussed it, not, not done, I mean, I'd like your view on it, uh, because I didn't get the salmon producer's view on it, uh, although some of them privately said yes. So why should we not have a sole agency to take the Scottish salmon industry to the next level? Why shouldn't we have one agency, one fit, and that's where they go to? Well, I think that provided the, um, the sustainability challenges can be met, it, it will be possible um, for the industry to develop and grow. Um, and I don't think that the lack of a single agency 
will prevent that. I don't think it's a blockage. I think in theory it's an attractive idea. I'm attracted to it in theory, but in practice, as I pointed out in my last answer, and I hope I made the point reasonably clearly, the regulators do different jobs. Uh, it might be simpler to have one fresh regulator, but you know the SEPA does um, a, a job across the whole of the environment, uh, and it's got a group of experts that, that assist in that task. I should say that SEPA's remit is a matter for the Cabinet Secretary for the Environment, so it doesn't fall within my direct purview. So, you know, I think you, I should perhaps defer to her in that regard. But whilst I'm attracted in principle to the idea of a one-stop shop, I think in practice it would involve dismantling the whole framework of planning and regulation in the country. And I think rather than pursue that approach immediately, I think we should focus on the task in hand of the consenting review, the wild fish interactions, uh, the fish health framework, and uh, I'm, I'm reasonably confident, convener, that, that, uh, uh, that as we do focus on that in the next 12 months, we will continue to see the improvements that you heard about last week that are coming through from massive investment by our companies. We want to bring up the standard of the lowest to the standard of the best, uh, and we want to continue the investment in science of SAIC, which is absolutely crucial, I think, to Scotland's success story. And we want also to try out innovative methods as well, something we haven't perhaps touched on, uh, as they're doing in Norway, and invest in that too, but guided always by a robust approach in protecting the environment. Okay, and I'm going to bring in Graham Day. I'm sure he's got a small question on that. Uh, th thank you, Kavira. It, it was just uh, an observation um, on, on this issue, um, because whilst on one level, this is quite an att attractive idea to, to reduce the number of regulators. There is actually, I think, a jurisdictional issue here beyond ministerial portfolios, which is that one of the agencies, the, the body that regulates the transportation of dead fish, which has attracted a lot of negative publicity, and rightly so, um, is actually a UK government agency. I think I'm right in saying that. It's the, um, I think it's AFA, or APHA, the Animal, Plant and Health, Association, I think Mr. Day is quite correct that it has the um, regulatory role in respect of the um, transportation issue. Um, so, you know, he's right to raise that as in the context of being an additional or further regulator that hitherto uh, we, we hadn't mentioned. Thank you. Uh, Jamie Green, the next question. Thank you, Convener. Um, it's fair to say we're very much drawing to a close of much of the evidence that we've taken and uh, one of the things that strikes me is that we have a difficult task as a committee to uh, try and summarise all of this. Uh, I think there's a lot of goodwill across the board um, to ensure that the industry itself has the opportunity to grow in the way that we all want it to but there's clearly uh, a lot of um, uh, voices out there who want to see it done in a a planned, measured, sustainable way uh, that benefits the communities that it operates in as well as the environment. Um, we have taken a lot of evidence about Norway uh, and we look to them, uh, I guess, due to their similarities to our industry here. But one of the striking differences about how the Norwegian government approached this very differently from how it may be looked at now is they took a much more top-down approach. So the, 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 the Fish Farming Act, the Agriculture Act, the uh, setup of the, uh, the geographic um, areas which had the traffic light system and by default the way that they even issue licences and regulate that industry is very, very different from how we do it here. And they've seen so much more growth over the last decade than we have. What are the key lessons do you think we could learn or what has the Scottish Government uh, specifically looked at that they may seek to adopt? In future policy and how this industry uh, grows and what would the cabinet secretary say to us as a committee uh, who are hoping to try and at least summarize some of this um, uh, in terms of some of the areas that we should be concentrating on um, to ensure that government takes a much bigger role in the industry uh, moving forward well i think the government does take a, a, a major role in in providing leadership and the industry leadership group which uh, uh, which the Scottish Government attend, uh, is brings together on a Team Scotland basis the public and private sector. Uh, and uh, one of the advantages of, of uh, the size of Scotland is that we can bring people into a room and, and work together with goodwill to, revol to, to devise the best ways to tackle complex problems. 
and this is a, 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 a this is a, a way that we use across across the board, and rightly so. And I think we have an advantage in that in that regard. Um, in the consenting review, we will look at the balance between local and national, but we do also need to consider local democracy. Uh, we can't dictate to local planning authorities what they do. I'm not sure if that's been what's suggested. I don't think it is. Uh, but we do also legislate, so that's a top-down approach, and I've ref I think we've, we've heard from Mr. Allen much of the, regular, the legislative framework. We also uh, work to promote the food and drink sector very vigorously, and I think it's the, perhaps the fastest growing sector convener, and of that, salmon is the most important uh, component, of food component, in terms of exports. And I personally am involved in you know, attending events in Brussels, as I did recently, uh, attending um, a trade fairs and shows in order to promote Scottish salmon and high-quality Scottish food and drink. So I think we do a lot, but I think you know, Mr Green is correct that there may be opportunities to, uh, to learn. Um, I mean, one of the points earlier that was made I thought was quite telling was that Mr Mitchell said, well, why haven't we got the, the reporting um, regime up to date as it is in Norway, and I think he alluded to an enormous investment that Norway have made. It would be interesting to find out how enormous that investment was. Um, so plainly there's a resource issue. I mean, I shouldn't mention that Norway has got an oil fund which is worth a billion pounds, so it helps uh, worth, a, no, a, a trillion pounds, is it? Sorry, it's, it's so large. That, but I mean, plainly it's invested from oil to be able to diversify into other ways, so it makes it easier to find the money to do things such as Mr. Mitchell referred to. Uh, going back to specifics, they have a green license system where the fee is reduced for companies that trial new technologies, whether that's closed containment or some other form of dealing with sea lice or other challenges. Um, so I think you know, that's one example where we can maybe incentivize innovative um, uh, suggestions and models, innovative for best practice in the environment, uh, or trialling new methods and technologies with a lower fee. You know, I'm very keen to, to adopt that sort of lever in government. Um, and you know, if this committee, I mean, rather than sort of general statement that Norway is brilliant and Scotland, Scotland is not brilliant or whatever, if the committee can identify specific examples of where you believe that we could learn more from Norway, of course, um, I'm happy to, to follow that up and uh, that might justify my trip to Norway as well. Jamie, would you like to come uh, back? That, that leads final. nicely into my final question, and that's uh, a very specific thing that Norway does very differently from here, and that's the issue of licences. Licences are issued uh, and released in tranches, both at a fixed price cost, uh, but also via an auction process. It generates substantial amounts of revenue, uh, in, in essence, to the Norwegian government, but the majority, the lion's share of that is devolved to the coastal communities that it benefits, around 80% of the, of the revenue goes to the coastal community municip municipalities. Um, has the Scottish Government given a lot of thought to the concept that they may introduce uh, some form of auction processes uh, to these licences, which, uh, as is the case in Norway, don't just benefit large operators with deep pockets, but also have the ability for smaller, newer producers and operators to participate in those auctions as well? And uh, what thought they have given to how that may be achieved, either via uh, um, uh, legal means, regulatory means, or indeed uh, legislation itself? At the, at the convener's behest, uh, a short two-sentence answer. Yes, we have considered this on the Aquaculture Industry Leadership Group. And yes, we shall be considering this further in the course of the consenting review to which I have previously alluded. Thank you. That draws to the end our sixth evidence session on the salmon aquaculture inquiry, which comes on top of two evidence sessions taken by the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee and the excellent report they produced, and also on the visit that the committee undertook uh, to a fish farm and a wild fishery on the west coast. Um, there seems to be some areas of common ground, and, and I was trying to just to work them out, that both sides uh, accept that there are hazards uh, with, with the operations out there, not only to the environment, uh, but it also to fish, and the, there's an acceptance to management, manage it. There was an acceptance by the fish farmers that there were some environmental problems and that new science may be the way forward. And there seems to be an, an agreement by both sides 
that, that there needs to be the minimisation of the effect on the environment. And I'd like to quote, uh, if I may, one comment uh, from Ben Hadfield, who's been quoted extensively during this, is that we have a moral responsibility as farmers to get it right. And I think that is the obligation that we now face as a committee as we sit down to write our report. We have the moral obligation to consider all the evidence that we've been given. And I think the evidence we've been given, not only in committee stage, but also the written evidence submissions that have been given to us, has been quite excellent and, and very detailed in some cases. The committee would welcome uh, the information from SEPA regarding uh, the sector uh, framework that we're looking forward to receiving. And the sooner we have that, the, the more we will be able to consider it within our report. And indeed, the Cabinet Secretary mentioned other activities that are going on and that he is leading regarding the fish health framework. And again, if that could form part of our report, it would also allow us to consider the whole industry and the whole issue that we've been considering uh, as a round. So I would like to say that um, although we've now finished our evidence session, the difficulty now will be producing the report. And uh, I'm sure as a committee, we look forward to that. So thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for the evidence you've given today. Thank you, Charles and Mike and Alistair for the evidence that you've given. And I'd now like to suspend the meeting while we allow the witnesses to, uh, for the witnesses to leave. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'd now like to reconvene the meeting and move to agenda item four, which is subordinate legislation. At agenda item four, the consideration of two negative instruments as detailed on the agenda. I would advise the committee that have been no motions to annul have been received in relation to either of these instruments. If I could just make a comment, if I may, before I ask whether the committee wishes to make a recommendation. In the policy notes that goes with the CAP uh, SSI, I'm disappointed to see that there is still, it is still longer than the SSI which it purports to uh, uh, support. Now, I know there may be reasons for that, 
But all I have ever asked is that there are short briefings so the policy can be understood. And I know that that might entail a separate uh, bit of paper to be produced, but to produce a briefing on a paper that is longer than the paper, actually, I have to say, raises the question. Now, Stuart, uh, I know you want to come in on that, and I'll let you come in briefly. Um, I, I just want to perhaps put a slightly different view, because I've just done a quick check. There are five pages in the policy note and seven pages in the SSI. There are 120 lines in the policy note, 240 in the SSI. So I'm not sure that actually, I don't want to detract from the general point that policy notes should be clear. But I think in this particular case, um, it may be that when we look, oh, and by the way, the, uh, the print uh, size in the policy note is two points larger than the print size in the SSI. So I, th I think there's a, a, a general issue that you're absolutely correct and I support you in raising, but in this particular case, uh, where much of the SSI is inserting into other instruments, which you can't understand without a policy note that explains what it is it's been inserted to, that it may not be as justified in this case as it often is in others. Okay, and uh, I'm now going to declare my interest as a, as a farmer and a rural surveyor with 15 years' practice. I have to say the policy note was difficult for me to understand, and maybe with 15 years' experience and practice, it, it perhaps says something. And the only other comment I would make, sometimes pages, font size, and lines don't actually make add up to the same as word count, and I will just leave it there. I think we need to produce shorter policy notes so people can understand it. I would therefore like to move straight on to the question is, is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to any of these instruments? It is agreed. The committee will now move into private session. Thank you.